Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here to the high-level event of the European Alliance for Apprenticeships, celebrating 10 years um, since the start of IAFA. I'm delighted to welcome all the physical participants who are here in the room, uh, and of course also the online participants, so a big hello to you as well. Uh, my name is Vicky Donlevy. Um, I'm the director of the support contracts um, supporting the apprenticeship support services uh, since 2018 uh, from Ecoris, and I'm delighted to be your moderator uh, overall for these next two days. So looking forward very much uh, to the event. Um, so before we start, we have a few uh, housekeeping rules to share with you, which will be coming up on the screen. Um, so firstly, um, we very much hope that this event will be interactive. Um, I know many of you around the room, I know you'll have lots of questions and comments, and we really encourage that. Um, so there will be microphones in for all the question and answer sessions uh, throughout the day, so please don't hesitate to be active. Uh, please also keep your phone or laptop within reach, um, as you will need them to participate in the various uh, Slido quizzes uh, that we'll be doing throughout the afternoon and tomorrow. Um, for the people who are online, if you have any technical issues, um, live support is available uh, to you on the platform, uh, or you can contact us at the email address, which you have on the screen. Um, and this afternoon, we have a coffee break uh, at 4.30 p.m. in the coffee corner, which you uh, would have seen out there. Uh, and finally, we really invite all of you to stay till the end of the day, because there is a cocktail at the end of the day uh, with some little bits to eat. Um, so please do stay until then, and we very much hope to enjoy those social moments with you all as well. So in terms of the agenda uh, for this afternoon, um, so um, we have the pleasure to have with us Mr. Joost Korte, who will be giving us a, a, a welcome and uh, a first speech um, celebrating 10 years of IAFA. Uh, we will then have a panel uh, involving the European social partners uh, who will speak. After that, we move to the signing ceremony. Um, so we have new pledges uh, to celebrate. Um, so there'll be a signing ceremony for that. After that, we move to the first panel of the afternoon, um, which will be celebrating the fifth anniversary. So we're the 10th anniversary of IAFA, but the fifth anniversary of the FQA, which is the European Framework for Quality and Effective Apprenticeships. Um, so we'll have a panel celebrating that. After that, we have the coffee break, as I mentioned earlier. Then we move to our second panel, um, which will be looking at apprenticeships as a means to secure skilled employees. After that, um, there will be a presentation of the IAFA champions. You'll hear about that uh, a bit later on. And um, finally, um, we will have the, um, the, the, the cocktail at um, 6 o'clock uh, till 8 o'clock. So please stay until then. Um, we were hoping to have with us uh, the Commissioner, Nicholas Schmidt, uh, with us today, but unfortunately, due to a last-minute uh, urgency, he has uh, had to cancel his participation. Um, so we're sorry he's not with us, but we have uh, other speakers um, to present to him, and he sends his regards uh, and his very much his support for this event. So without uh, further ado at this stage, um, I would like to invite our first uh, speaker, um, and that's Mr. Joost Korta, uh, who will be giving us uh, an introductory speech. Thank you, Mr. Korta. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vicky, for your introductory words, and welcome to everybody here. I'm extremely happy to be able to open this event, festive event, I guess I may say so, with two anniversaries to celebrate. Vicky already uh, hinted at this, not only uh, the 10th anniversary of the Alliance for Apprenticeship, but also five years of uh, the European Framework for Quality and Effective Apprenticeship. So you've got really something to celebrate, and I'm very happy to see a full room here in front of me and also so many people who are online uh, following us, following your um, discussions today and, and also uh, tomorrow. I mean, my welcoming remarks, I think, can be, can be quite brief, but I wanted to uh, point out 
at two issues. First of all, a bit of looking back, what happened in these 10 years and what have we achieved, and then also looking forward how we are going about with apprenticeships and how this also um, features rather prominently in the European Year of Skills that started on the 9th of May. If I look back, so 10 years ago, 2030, where were we when the Alliance was launched? In fact, we were, Europe was in a very bad state at the time. If you look at the figures, just recovery from the financial crisis, uh, we had the highest unemployment rate ever in the European Union. The uh, unemployment rate in those days was about 12%. That means about 26 million people were out of a job at the time. And many had actually left the European Union to try to find work elsewhere. Young people were in an even worse situation. It's double the unemployment rate of adults. So one in four young people in the European Union were out of work, 23%. And even more than half of young people in countries such as uh, Spain and Greece. Uh, in response to that fairly dramatic situation at the time, the European Union adopted a package of measures, which then also gave birth to the alliance. First of all, there was the youth guarantee, which has, was later reinforced and has ever since helped according to our data, approximately 50 million young people. And there was also funding made available through the Youth Employment Initiative to roll out the policy through the European Social Fund. And the European Alliance, as I said, was very much part of this package and is therefore now also 10 years in existence. In fact, apprenticeships were, con were in those days included as one of the four types of offers that were part of the youth guarantee, together with continued education, jobs, and traineeships. So the fourth branch on the tree. The Alliance was a joint initiative of the Commission, together with the Lith Lithuanian presidency of the Council at the time, and also the social partners, who are also uh, welcome here today, and they have always been a very important partner in this exercise with us. Well, since then, close to 400 members have joined the Alliance, sharing their experience and pledging for over 1 million apprenticeship placements. Later, in 2018, another key milestone was when the Council adopted the European Framework for Quality and Effective Apprenticeship. So that was in 2018. And this recommendation has again be, been a key reference to guide member states' reforms and improve the quality of apprenticeships in the European Union, with better working conditions and social protection for apprenticeships, very much in line also with the European pillar of social rights. Both the Alliance and the framework have in fact been an inspiration all across Europe. Just a few examples are, if we look at the situation in France, significantly increases in the number of apprenticeships to more than 800,000, uh, which is a 60% increase from between 2020 and 2022 in the number of apprenticeships. In Spain, another example, which has uh, conducted an ambitious reform of the, its vocational and educational training system to transform most VET and training programs in, uh, into apprenticeships. But these are just a few examples. I'm sure that you uh, with your experience, can mention a number of other good, good points that were achieved <coughs> since uh, 2013. So where are we now? And how do we go forward from here in this European Year of Skills? In 2023, luckily, the situation is, is a lot better in the European Union compared to 2013. We have a very strong labour market and record low unemployment. Record high in 2013, record low today. Today, the unemployment uh, figure in the European Union is about 6%, which is really the, lo the lowest ever on record. Uh, and youth employment is also a lot lower, though still, of course, much too high, with uh, about 12 or 13%. We also have labor shortages, as you know, in many sectors of the economy. So the situation from that point of view is a lot better. But we are also facing huge challenges. <laughs> Huge challenges, uh, the climate emergency, a high cost of living triggered mostly by the uh, uh, Russian war of aggression in Ukraine and the high energy prices, 
and also what I would call a global race for talent, which, as I said, record labor shortages with an ever-shrinking workforce in the European Union. When you look at the figures, according to the estimates, our labor market is expected to lose about one million people every year between now and 2050. <coughs> Companies cannot find the talent they need, and this has become an obstacle to their investment and their growth in particular in fast-paced sectors linked to the green and digital transitions with the, where there is this potential of creating many, many quality jobs. And here again, I think the apprenticeships come in uh, with a very big importance because many of these jobs that we need are technical in nature. They are linked to the green and digital transitions. And this is why vocational education and training, and more specifically, uh, traineeships are relevant now more than ever before. I'm all very happy to see my colleagues here from the two agencies in the European Union that deal with these issues, the ETF and CEDIFOP, who will also speak to you later in the programme. Um, so, and these, um, these apprenticeships are an important goal of the European Year of Skills, therefore. And this makes the role of this alliance extremely important. Uh, and, and an important part of the, of the Year of Skills, to help build public awareness about the benefits of apprenticeships and work towards better systems and programs that lead to quality jobs. Money, for once, is not the issue anymore. We are, we are coming out of a long period where the European budget was, in, in fact, quite uh, small where it comes to education and skills. Now, if we look at the figures, and you combine the European Social Fund Plus with the uh, Recovery and Resilience Facility, member states dispose of very, very big funds uh, to help them invest in apprenticeships and in VET. Uh, again, according to our estimates, if you add the two up, there is easily 65 billion euros available for investment in skills. Question is, of course, are member states using this money? That's a different matter, but it is there. And it's, I think it's also your role to, uh, to, in fact, advocate that this money is indeed well spent in those sectors where the European Union uh, needs them. So the Year of Skills is about starting a conversation and inflating, initiating, sorry, initiating a progress to promote a more, much more positive mindset of upskilling and reskilling. And I think what has already happened since it started and since the President announced it last year in our State of the Union is that the issue has risen a lot on the political agenda of the European Union. It's quite something to, to now read in the conclusions of the European Council about skills, which was for many, many years, not for me or my colleagues, a nice to have, but not a strategic asset. And I think this has really changed a lot in the, in the way that politicians speak about skills, about human talent and about the need to invest in them and how this is indeed a strategic asset a strategic requirement for our economies in the European Union. Um, the European Commission is organizing over 750 events uh, so far for the Year of Skills, and today is one of them, where we bring social partners and stakeholders from across the board together uh, and where uh, we find it useful to continue working in this direction. In fact, we'll have the social partners speaking right after me. Today's program and tomorrow's program will range a number of topics on quality, sustainability, apprenticeships for adults, skilled employees, and all are equally relevant to address the current challenges we face. And before concluding, I would like to thank the organizing team and our European social partners who have been part of the Alliance since the very beginning. Their support has been instrumental over these past years, so I'm really glad that we can have this joint event today. Voila, without further ado, I warmly thank you all for your engagement and wish you a very fruitful discussion. And I would suppose we applaud, not for me, but for 10 years of the Alliance.
Thank you very much, Mr. Corte, for this opening um, presentation, which I think has really set the scene uh, for the event for the next two days, reminding us of the achievements of the last 10 years, um, but also looking at the, the current challenges we have and the way forward. Uh, and I think this is really um, the, the essential backdrop to what we're going to be looking at um, over uh, the rest of this event. Um, so, without further ado, as was mentioned, um, we are moving now to uh, the discussion uh, with the social partners who, as Mr. Corti reminded, um, have been always a very key, um, key players uh, in the field of apprenticeships. Um, so, I would invite our uh, four representatives of the social partners um, to come and sit on the stage. Um, so, we're delighted to have with us Mr. Ludovic Wurt, uh, who is Confederal Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation, Maxime Chiruti, who is Director of Social Affairs at Business Europe, Valentina Guerra, who is uh, Policy Director for Social Affairs and Training at SME United, and finally, uh, Guillaume Affela, who is Senior Policy uh, Advisor at SGI Europe. I will come over to join you. Thank you very much again for, for joining us uh, here. Um, so the first question that I have is for you, uh, Ludovic. Uh, so um, how do you see the role of the trade unions in achieving the goals of the IAFA in the last 10 years? What has been your role in that? Um, and also, what do you think IAFA should focus on in the future? Thank you. Thank you, and uh, happy to be with all of you here. Uh, you can. Yes, you can hear. So yeah, 10 years ago when, uh, I, I'm going to say uh, more or less the same that you just said, uh, when uh, the Council uh, Declaration uh, on the European Alliance for Apprenticeship uh, was adopted, the EU was uh, indeed uh, climbing out of the uh, 2008 uh, financial crisis and economical crisis and youth unemployment and unemployment qu were quite high. So uh, for youth uh, unemployment, we were at 23, 24 percent uh, of youth unemployment. So almost one out of four young people uh, in unemployment. And now this rate is still important at 14.4 uh, percent, but it's clear that it's uh, uh, less important than uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the question is, of course, uh, the statistics. There's also discussion on the uh, on the statistics because if people are not anymore in the 24% of youth unemployment, where are they? Uh, there can be, uh, and we have seen in the last 10 years, the development of a lot of precarious jobs also. So some of them are in precarious jobs. But if they have been going through apprenticeship, we're quite sure that it's not the case, that uh, apprenticeship can lead uh, to good quality employment, and uh, this is the best level, uh, the, the best uh, support to entry in the la uh, labor market uh, with uh, good uh, working conditions. So uh, the more we support apprenticeship, uh, the more this drop in unemployment, uh, we can make sure that it's also uh, linked to uh, good working uh, conditions. Uh, this council uh, declaration at that moment was also based on a lot of discussions of the social partners, discussion also with the commission, uh, to provide tools to governments uh, to uh, use apprenticeship in order to help exactly uh, these young people, these vet students, uh, to enter the labor market and to try to uh, also focus on the question of uh, not allowing exploitation of cheap labor in the labor market, which was of course a tendency and a trend after the financial crisis. We are also happy that we are celebrating this uh, today, uh, which means that there's hundreds of social partners at national level, of companies, of vet providers, institutions that have committed uh, since uh, 2013 and have joined uh, since uh, 2013. Uh, the our expectations as trade union is clear to link the discussion uh, with uh, quality jobs uh, creation. It's also uh, making sure that social dialogue is at the center of apprenticeship uh, systems. So in designing vet and apprenticeship strategies, we need the involvement of uh, social partners, not only because we want a place at the table, but because we are representative of people uh, that uh, ha in real life uh, can be helped uh, in uh, and in real uh, conditions. Uh, we can uh, create uh, in the uh, in the companies uh, real good uh, conditions for integration in uh, in the labor market, and we think it's also because of the involvement of social partners 
that one of the seven targets defined uh, for the EU member states under the Euro uh, European Education Area Strategy Framework have been achieved. This target that has been achieved is the 60% participation of vet students in work-based learning. This would have been impossible without uh, social partners and I think it's also uh, a lesson uh, for, the other, uh, for the other objectives that if it's done with social partners it works well. Um, I think it's also important, it was mentioned, to recognize that today is also the, uh, uh, the we are celebrating the fifth year anniversary uh, of the Council recommendation for a European quality and effective framework for apprenticeship. And we are proud that this was uh, an initiative for the trade unions of the trade unions and a proposal of the social partners uh, to the Commission and the Council. Uh, and uh, due to this, since, 20, uh, uh, si uh, since then, there's a lot of apprenticeship that are of high quality and that we can also look at the 14 uh, objectives of this uh, quality framework looking at the condition of pay of working conditions which are of course uh, essential uh, for uh, trade unions also the issues of uh, health and safety and we are quite happy also that five years after uh, this uh, quality framework was adopted the ILO in the last uh, few weeks discussed also this at the international levels, so showing that what we propose with social partners uh, and in tripartite discussions uh, can uh, have an impact also in uh, international uh, discussions. However, the work is clearly not uh, finished. Uh, as, it, uh, as, is, as it is always mentioned, we are uh, facing a digital and a green transition of our economy. There's a lot of funding uh, uh, on the table now to support companies uh, to do that. If this can be through, it has to be through job, uh, uh, good uh, quality jobs. It can also be through good uh, apprenticeship. We, show, uh, we saw also that in the uh, Net Zero Industry Act, the focus on uh, apprenticeship is quite uh, important. Uh, and uh, yeah, this shows uh, that it's also a way uh, to take into account that the future uh, transition of the labor market uh, has to also be done with the tools that works the, uh, the best. So uh, apprenticeship uh, with making sure also, and that's a trade union demand, that there's also the social conditionality that goes behind uh, show, uh, making sure that the companies that receive uh, funding to uh, support the transition, they also respect collective bargaining, that they respect uh, uh, the, the investment uh, in uh, quality uh, apprenticeship, uh, in the inv uh, also in the uh, training of their uh, uh, of their workers to be and the right of their workers to be reskilled uh, and uh, upskilled, and this is uh, partly the case of a lot of companies already doing this, already financing employee training. But with the challenge that we have in front of us, it's even uh, more important that the inclusiveness of this discussion, the uh, that uh, this training is not only accessible to those who are uh, with uh, good uh, working conditions uh, already in a uh, uh, fixed uh, uh, in a, uh, on, on determined contract uh, often white male uh, from uh, middle uh, middle age uh, 30, uh, 35 uh, to 45 uh, years old so the act, uh, the question of inclusiveness uh, making sure that women workers young workers uh, unemployed workers uh, also with support of public services there uh, but also migrant workers in our economy we can access uh, training and their apprenticeship, apprenticeship also for adults, uh, can be uh, supported to make sure that the first principle of uh, the European pillar of social rights is really a reality for uh, every worker and future worker. Uh, and for this, we will need to have discussions uh, to make uh, sure that uh, we have also an inclusive approach for that. We cannot just say there is a uh, uh, change with the green transition and the digital transition to do. You have all in front of you uh, the choices of training, etc. It will be also, uh, it's not a question only of information, it's a question of a pathway that we have to build for workers uh, to get involved, uh, to get also the, uh, tr uh, the confidence, the trust uh, in the transition that they will not lose working conditions, that they will not lose uh, wages, etc. That they are at the center of the transition. Same thing, I'm quite sure SMEs will say also that they should be also at the center of the transition and they should, I think, also take more the opportunity to uh, take uh, apprentice, uh, apprentices to uh, and make sure that there's quality framework uh, there uh, also. Maybe to conclude, I'm not sure if I'm already running out of time. I, I am, I'm sure. 
I have a minute, very good. So in the context of facing the cost of living crisis this year, uh, also uh, following the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I think it's also important that we in these discussions uh, have the starting point on uh, good working conditions because it's also what makes that people can pay their, uh, for their living, uh, that they can uh, uh, survive. So the question of uh, precariousness, the question of apprenticeship being well paid also is uh, quite important and this is where also we need to close another loophole, the loophole of traineeship at EU level and we are quite uh, happy that the European Parliament uh, last uh, in the last plenary also called for a quality framework uh, to, uh, to improve uh, the, the quality framework for uh, traineeship and that there should also be a European initiative uh, for traineeship and we hope that the European Commission will soon launch a social partners consultation on the topic because then it would uh, allow us to have another part uh, in the labor market with quality uh, traineeship at the center and then the next discussion for us as social partners i think will be how to improve uh, then the quality f uh, having a quality framework for employee training at least ensuring that we can discuss uh, how uh, with a, a right-based approach we can uh, ensure that workers can grab, have a, a meaningful and right uh, um, access to employee training. So with all of this we would have then in all the labor market touched at all the type of public, public that have to be supported in this transition and uh, that they are then ready uh, for the transitions that we will be facing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ludovic, for reminding the importance of the role of social partners, but also reminding of the importance of working conditions, uh, inclusivity uh, in apprenticeships, um, and also uh, lots of uh, future focus um, for where things um, you would like to see um, work develop in this area. So turning now to businesses, um, I'd like to ask uh, Maxime uh, the questions um, around... So. IAFA um, has been a success in terms of creating over one million apprenticeships in the past decade, but it's equally important that these apprenticeships are both effective and of high quality. What is the view of businesses on this? Thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here today as social partners and with the Commission to, to take stock and to celebrate um, the 10 years anniversary of the Alliance. We were part of it from the start, and I think it's uh, a big group here that uh, is with practitioners from everywhere in Europe. Um, and I think apprenticeships is really the kind of issue that has been mobilizing. Um, and I think the Commission had a good framework for that with the Alliance, where we have been very engaged um, over the years, because we think that um, it was crucial to make good steps in relation with the provision of apprenticeships. But I think we should take a step back as well. I mean, we have a culture in Europe of doing apprenticeships since the Middle Ages. So it's something that is really founded in a long culture in Europe. And so the Alliance um, has been useful to create a dynamic on the European level. But I think we start from a place where it's really deep into our culture to do that. Um, when it comes to, to where we are now, I think, um, what is, of course, with apprenticeships very positive is that there is this kind of very practical learning of a job, of an occupation, by being in the company. And, and that is uh, on our message in the beginning, that really improving the participation of the, the apprentices in the, in the companies, having good conditions um, for more of the training time to take place in the companies, and uh, as we all know, we have different practitioners here. There is also the school element to it. But I think we are making steps in the right direction. And um, the reforms that we could see, some of them mentioned by Joost before, um, are going in the direction of, of trying to yeah, increase the attractiveness of apprenticeships in a society for the enterprises, for the, the, the young people and their families, so that there is uh, improvements made on what has been the trigger of everything we do here, which is that there was a, a rather lukewarm or negative image of vocational training that has been over the last decades, taking more space and developing, and, and I think we have changed that. Um, so the narrative of the alliance, the fact that since 10 years we are all united here on the European level as part of this alliance, 
and that we are convinced of the benefits this has for enterprises, for the young people, and for society at large makes a difference. And I think it recognizes that in all these jobs and their evolutions with the twin transitions, um, there are many of these tasks that can be very well trained through apprenticeships, be it for the digital, digital or the greening um, transition. And um, having this recognized in the provision of apprenticeships, I think is a challenge for all of us now to, to make it real. But I think it is, um, it is also, of course, the fact that uh, we need to improve the responsiveness of everything we do um, so that um, there is a stronger link between the changing jobs requirements and the training in the companies. And, and that is, of course, member states that need to do that. It's a national competence. Um, but in the, the, the apprenticeship, of course, it's very essential to work together between member states and, and the social partners, and particularly the companies playing a key role here. So that is uh, something that is happening now. But we also need, of course, to broaden the participation in apprenticeships. And I'm very pleased that in this conference, there is a focus on adults' participation in apprenticeship. I think it's essential if we want to reach a 60% target in the, the context of the action plan on the pillar of social rights. And I think it is um, going forward going to be a challenge for all those countries that do not have this culture yet. Um, but working together, we can make good steps in this direction. And today is a day of celebration. I think my last point is perhaps a bit more on, on where we need to improve. Um, and it was great to have Ecoris working on the support services. We have a big question mark is what is going to follow next? We've heard that DG reform is going to take over and we really support DG reform is taking this over. Um, but we need someone in charge and we need to have good support provided to member states and social partners on how to reform apprenticeship systems across Europe. Because if we have positive results, we are far from being at the end of the process. I think a lot more can be done and needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much for this view from, from Business Europe. And again, many uh, interesting points, I think, for the discussions uh, over the next two days. Um, so turning now to the SMEs. Uh, so the perspective from, from Valentina Guerra, who we're very pleased to have with us. Um, so we know that SMEs have a keen interest in apprenticeships, despite the fact that sometimes there can be constraints and challenges, uh, both in financial uh, and human resources terms. Um, so perhaps if you can reflect on how the Alliance has been able to support them over the last um, 10 years um, and how the Alliance can continue to support them going forwards. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you very much, Vicky, and good afternoon to all of you. I'm uh, very pleased that SME United and together with the other social partners uh, gets the chance to celebrate such a successful milestone for the, for the Alliance. Well, Crafts and SMEs uh, are the main providers of apprenticeship in Europe, and they consider that it's the best way to learn on the job, to transfer skills and uh, know-how, especially in the craft sector, but also to uh, motivate future entrepreneurs to create businesses and create jobs in Europe, especially in some sectors and in some professions. The biggest challenge for SMEs at the beginning was to recognize apprenticeship as an investment rather than a cost. And I think this is the first uh, big achievement of the alliance towards, uh, towards crafts and SMEs. Um, and the second one to su was to support them on more practical uh, uh, challenges where despite uh, practical but were very big, especially for small companies. And I, I can name three in, uh, in specifically. The first one is all the administrative requirements that are uh, um, there for, for, for apprenticeship to take place, the financial costs, but also the good matching between the candidates and the companies. And this is why uh, we advocated together with the other social partners for uh, the good uh, framework uh, to be in place. And uh, you can really see that the second celebration that we are having today really had an impact on the, uh, on, on the, the, the take up of apprenticeship by companies. But now, as uh, we already mentioned, the context is completely different. Um, we have, uh, uh, we can see in the current trends that uh, the take up of apprenticeship by young people is uh, d decreasing. And also we are in a context with increased uh, labor shortages and, and, uh, and skills mismatches. So we need to act, it's really the time. And uh, with the European Year of Skills, of course, we can put all our uh, efforts to, to make this uh, possible in the future years. 
And um, when I think about the future of, uh, of the Alliance and the support that uh, the, the Alliance can give to SMEs in particular, I think about uh, improving the image of uh, VAT in our societies. This is uh, becoming a, a very strong request uh, from uh, SMEs and crafts because we are in a moment where the offers of, of apprenticeship are higher than the demand. And uh, we need to ensure that VET is not a dead end for, for students. VET students uh, wants to want to continue and have uh, excellent uh, education pathways and they want to uh, reach also be able also to reach academic education. So I would like to put forward this, uh, this request and this call to uh, to put in the political agenda more support uh, both at European but also at national level to improve the, the uh, higher VET and uh, higher VET offers. And the second um, avenue of support that I can see for the Alliance in the future is to ensure that uh, social partners are embedded in the governance of, uh, of, uh, of the apprenticeship systems at national level. As uh, Ludovic already reminded, uh, this is really important because we do represent the, the, the people, the companies that make these things happen. And also uh, by observing the well-functioning system, we see that uh, the, these are possible because there is a shared responsibility among the different stakeholders at the table. Uh, the companies, the public authorities, the, the individuals, the vet providers, and this uh, absolutely uh, needs to be ensured in all member states. And also I would like to, to conclude uh, on, on specific support for um, uh, the organizations that uh, help companies and uh, in particular crafters and SMEs on the ground uh, to make that apprenticeships are less uh, burdensome for them. Uh, I'm particularly referring to, to the social partners that offer these uh, services uh, to companies, sometimes for the administrative uh, requirements or they can uh, provide counseling on how to um, uh, find the right funding for, for, the, for, for the young people. So um, I would like to conclude uh, here and still congratulate all the teams that have uh, worked on, uh, on the Alliance in these years and wish you all the best for maybe the next 10 years. <laughs> Thank you so much, Valentina, for giving this really important perspective from the, the view of SMEs, and you rightly remind us the, the main providers of uh, apprenticeships. Uh, so a very important perspective to have. And so last but certainly not least, um, we turn to the perspective of the services of general interest. Um, and so uh, Guillaume, uh, who represents SGI Europe. Um, and the questions for you uh, are how you see the contribution of SGI Europe to the Alliance since 2013. Um, and whether employers of services of general interest face uh, different problems and challenges to those in the private sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's also, of course, an immense pleasure for me to be here with you, with my colleagues from the Social Partners Organization at the cross-sectoral level. So happy to see so many people in the room as well, and the people connected on online, of course. I mean, asking the question about what's happened, what we've done since 2013, allows us to allows me to, to to draw a little bit of history as well about what we've done as social partners, also together for the last 10 years, and it's quite a lot. Uh, Ludovic mentioned, for instance, how we were uh, as one some of the initiators through European-funded projects of the quality framework from apprenticeship uh, for effective and quality apprenticeship which started with the projects on the employee side, on the cost effectiveness of apprenticeship that we've led together, on the trade union side, on quality apprenticeship. And it's then when we put the two uh, together, these two projects, that we issued a joint statement that was then you know, calling for the advisory committee on vocational education and training to prepare a tripartite opinion that then led the groundwork for the recommendation, the initiation by the commission of the recommendation. So, I've always liked these examples because it shows how the work we do together really led some uh, of the groundwork for the progress that we can make together, that social partners can make together. 
on our side as SGI Europe, most of the work we've done over the past 10 years was to get closer to the colleagues from the vet providers' work, the employees from the vet world. Uh, they are actually members of organizations, of our organization, EFI, the European Federation of Education Employees, and we've done quite a few projects with them just to get closer to them, to understand how we can reconcile the understanding of the evolutions of the need for skills of our member SGI employees, and I fully recognize, of course, the issues that uh, Jos Korte has presented, for instance. Now our members are trying to tackle climate change. Uh, uh, sectors from the water, from energy, from waste management uh, are fully impacted with the needs to adapt their service delivery, and they cannot find the staff with the, the skills they require for this change. And that is their prime concern. That is some of the prime concern they, they tell us. The first one for a long time was still investment, public investment, the stability of investment, which already endangered their openness to recruit apprenticeship and apprentices. So this has always been a concern, but today it's really labor shortages. So we've worked on the issue of uh, EU funding. We've worked about this together with the trade union as well, with the project and the uh, social partners from the education sector. And uh, recently what we've done is looking more at the issue of green skills, which is a big issue as well since in the AFA since 2020, that has been tabled as one of the key priority. And on this, we've uh, now fully grasped the difficulty of defining what will be the green skills that we will need in the future. Uh, that's one of the projects we just concluded in 2022, actually, and that we, we led through COVID, so quite challenging to do, but still, nonetheless, we, we did it. And on this, we recognize that they are fully embedded with digital skills, that they are different from sectors to sectors, embedded in the new technologies that keep evolving. So the only ways to respond to this is to have very efficient, uh, responsive, as Maxime mentioned, uh, education and training system. And apprenticeship is one key pillar of this in order to respond to the need that we have. And we saw in this project many of the examples that we had from our members relied on apprenticeship system. Uh, a lot of, in France indeed, because quite a fast development of apprenticeship in France, but quite a lot of them still rely on apprenticeship and will keep relying on apprenticeship system. So we need to dedicate as much effort as we can to make apprenticeship even more efficient, even more quality indeed, because they will keep being a pillar also for us to respond to the key essential challenge of responding to climate change. But a key issue for all employers, and of course uh, we, will, we are dedicated to keep working on this, that's why we are also happy today to sign a new pledge for this benefit, so very happy to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Guillaume, for these um, additional thoughts uh, and reminding us of the importance um, of, the, of the commitment of the services of general interest to apprenticeships and reminding some of these key themes which will, again, come up in this topic. Um, so this concludes our, the welcome addresses. I think um, it's really launched, again, um, the discussions of the next two days very strongly with some of the key themes that will be coming, coming up over those two days, reminding us of the achievements of the last 10 years, but really reminding us that so more is yet to be done. There are new challenges um, to um, bring together uh, and really some, some key topics um, that we can look at uh, over the next uh, two days of the conference. So I'd like to thank, again, the social partners also for their commitment on this continued commitment uh, to apprenticeships, for their uh, fantastic welcome addresses for being with us uh, here. Um, and um, thank you very much. I can ask you to rejoin your seats. Thank you. So as mentioned, for the next part um, of the agenda, um, we will be celebrating, happily, uh, our alliance continues to grow, and we'll be ce celebrating uh, the joining uh, of some new members to the alliance. Um, so to introduce that session, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Manuela uh, Gelling, who's going to give us a presentation uh, on this. So Manuela, I'd like to invite you to give the, the introductory address. Thank you. So, good afternoon. I think it's not difficult for me to uh, say what I'm going to say because I think the introductory speech by Jost Korte and the panel we have just listened to has uh, testified to how much enthusiasm is, uh, is there and how much has happened during these 10 years and perhaps 
that there are still some areas where we need to, to work on in, in the future. But one thing was absolutely clear, there is a lot of enthusiasm, there is a lot of passion for, um, for apprenticeships. So I think uh, I'm very proud today to welcome 20 new members uh, to the Alliance, nine of which will be here in presence uh, to, uh, to join uh, the Alliance. And, uh, but perhaps I should also say that uh, we should also show ap appreciation for those members that have been there since a few years in, uh, in the Alliance, because I think 65 of them has, have chosen to renew their pledges. And this actually shows you that this is an Alliance that lives and flourishes. And uh, seven governments have actually also decided to renew their national commitment. Uh, so that also shows that companies, other organizations, but also public authorities are very much into uh, apprenticeships. And, um, and this is really a very uh, encouraging and positive sign. But without further ado, I think we can start with uh, the ceremony. Thank you very much, Manuela, for this introduction. Um, so as Manuela uh, said, we have um, 20 new members, nine of which are here. So I'd like to uh, perhaps invite them to uh, start uh, queuing up, as it were, <laughs> uh, down the side of the room here so that they're ready to receive their certificates. I have your uh, certificates here ready for you to sign. Um, so I will call you up one by one. Uh, you will then sign, um, sign your pledge here, uh, shake hands with Manuela, and then if I can ask you to stay in the middle because we will do a group photo uh, at the end of that. So don't go running back to your seats uh, immediately. Um, so first of all, I'm not sure you're in the correct, uh, the correct order, but hopefully everyone will find themselves. Uh, so I'd like to first of all welcome Francesco Errani, who is from the, the region of Emilia, Emilia Romagna. And second, again, I'm not sure on the order, um, we have Petru, Petru Vasily Gafuyek, I'm sorry for my pronunciation, um, who is from the Institute for Social Partnership in Bukovina. Congratulations. <laughs> Maybe no. later, okay. if that's possible. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> stop anyone, but later in the day, there will be lots of opportunities to speak. Um, so thirdly, this person I do recognise. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to welcome Guillaume uh, Afala to receive his uh, certificate uh, on behalf of SGI Europe. So please sign. And next, um, I would ask Sotiria Sal Salamani um, from the European Association for Institutes for Vocational Training. Uh, welcome and congratulations. <laughs> And next, I'd like to call up Alex Lenoir, who's from the European Vocational Training Association. Congratulations, your Thank certificate. You. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And next, uh, we have Elisabetta Bortoluzzi, who is from the municipality of Alpaggio. Welcome, congratulations. <laughs> 
on your foot. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> and next, we'd like to welcome Anna Maria Casato, who's from Consorcio Consolida. Many congratulations. And next, we'll welcome up Goran Spazowiski from the Vocational Education and Training Center. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, um, delighted to welcome Ines Delgado, who is from Turismo de Portugal. Congratulations. So congratulations and welcome to all the, the new members. There will now be a group photo. Perhaps if Manuela, you could stand in the in the center of the of the photo. Thank you very much to all the <laughs> thank you very much and congratulations to all the new members. Delighted to have you with us. Uh, so these are the nine members who are here. We also have 11 uh, further members who have joined, who are joining us online. So a very warm welcome and congratulations to you for signing your pledges. Um, we're also delighted that 65 um, of our existing members have also renewed their pledges. Um, they're too many to read, so they are scrolling uh, on the screen in front of you. Um, but we're really delighted with this uh, renewal uh, of the, the commitments that these organizations have made, which is so important. So many thanks to, to all of you um, for those who are here uh, and those who are joining us uh, online. Um, so a document with all the names uh, of the organizations, the new members and those who've renewed their pledges is on the website, so you can find it uh, on the website. Um, so following that, um, I'd like to uh, move us to the next phase of the agenda, and that's our, I'm delighted to have our first panel. Uh, as we've heard, we're celebrating today the fifth anniversary of the European Framework for Quality and Effective uh, apprenticeships, um, and so I'm delighted to welcome this panel um, and my colleague uh, Luca Mobilio, who will be moderating this panel. Thank you, Luca. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon, and welcome everyone to the first panel today. That, as Vicky said, stems from the fifth anniversary of the European Framework for Quality and Effective Apprenticeships. The framework was established in 2018 and uh, aimed to define a set of criteria considered essential for the success and for those apprenticeships and for um, allowing apprenticeships to reach their full potential. To the benefit and the advantage of apprentices, first of all, but also employers and the society as a whole. The framework defines 14 criteria, as uh, probably uh, you know, seven of which are um, focusing on learning and working conditions, as for example, pedagogical support for trainers and apprentices, uh, apprentices pay, and uh, the importance of setting learning outcomes. And the other seven are focusing on framework, uh, framework conditions, encompassing so areas as the involvement of social partners, support for companies, and um, the need to provide career guidance to apprentices. 
So before moving, if we move into the discussion, we would like to ask you um, to answer a quick slide of questions, so to have a first moment of interaction with the audience. So please take your, uh, your phones or your computer, and you can either scan the QR code or go to the um, slido.com and have the uh, hashtag EAFA. So uh, as you do, and we um, uh, would like to ask you to rank the following five criteria that we selected among the 14 uh, defined by the framework and uh, indicate the one that you think are the most and least implemented in member states. So it will be interesting to see what, what is your perspective on that. And we will circle back to this question later on in our discussion. Um, so maybe we can leave the slide on for a while while people vote. And in the meanwhile, I would like to ask all our speakers to please join us on the stage. So uh, I will ask Chiara Riondino. Chiara is the head of unit for vocational education and training in the Directorate General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion of the European Commission, where she's also responsible for skills uh, for the green and digital transformation. Chiara previously worked on employment policies, focusing mainly on employment opportunities and challenges in the changing world of work, active labor market policies, and fair working conditions. Uh, Chiara also worked more broadly on taking forward the European pillar of social rights. Please uh, uh, allow, uh, um, give her a big round of applause. Then um, uh, we have Srinivas Biredi, which is Chief of Skills and Employability Branch at the International Labour Organization in Geneva. He joined the ILO in the year 2000, and pre uh, prior to taking his, uh, this position in Geneva in 2018, he was Country Director of the ILO Office in Bangladesh. Srinivas has pre previously been a Senior Advisor on Technical Education, Education and Training, and Skills Development Specialist. He also has field experience in India, Indonesia, and Bangladesh. Uh, next, uh, please, a round of applause for Mr. <laughs> Kennedy. Um, then we have Karl Lamott. From, uh, he serves as a policy coordinator in the compulsory education unit at the Department of Education and Training in Flanders, Belgium. Karl has been uh, playing a pivotal role in constructing the Flemish apprenticeship system since 2015. He contributes also to multiple European frameworks focusing on apprenticeships, including his role as a bench learning coordinator and, uh, in the European Alliance for Apprenticeships, and also as an active participant in the expert group for, led by CEDEFOP. Karl holds a PhD in educational science, and his research focused on early school living, and in particular emphasizing the necessity of high quality vocation education and training. So thank you, Karl, for being here today. So that's and then I would like to call Sophie Grenad, which is Senior Policy Advisor for Industry Old European Trade Union. Her main areas of focus are raw material and circular economy. She's also in charge of the European Sectoral, so um, European Sectoral Social Dialogue Committees in gas, electricity, extractive industry, and pulp and paper sector, dealing with central issues as working conditions, skills, and, and apprenticeships. She has more than 10 years of trade union experience at national, European, and international level. So welcome again, Sophie, and all the uh, our participants. Two microphones, so one maybe we can, we can pass to Chiara. So as yes, as the session, am I following? No. Okay. Um, as the first uh, the session span stems from the European framework for quite effective apprenticeships, the first question is for Chiara, and I would like to ask you um, in which way do you think the framework is indeed supporting comprehensive gov uh, governance and attractiveness of apprenticeships in the member states? Thank you very much, Luca. Uh, I think the framework had an enormous impact on driving forward the attractiveness and effectiveness of apprenticeships. And uh, earlier, uh, Ludovic uh, said um, that we have reached the work-based learning uh, target in VET thanks to the social partner, that it would not have been possible without the social partners. But I am asking, uh, what can we achieve in apprenticeships without the social partners? So. It's a trick question. The answer is nothing, of course, uh, as uh, with the government and the other stakeholders. And this is why we have the alliance, because it's really a collective effort. And we have desperate systems in the member states in VET and apprenticeships. Uh, like Maxime mentioned, that um, we have been doing apprenticeships since 
centuries ago, and in fact, apprenticeships are part of uh, European DNA. I dare imagine that working conditions were not that great <laughs> at the time, so we have definitely <laughs> improved on that. Um, but uh, it also shows that uh, this is embedded in the different member states, and we all have a different history behind us. And the important role of the framework was to uh, indicate the way and how can we all go upwards together, picking the best of what exists. And I think that now you've mentioned uh, the 14 criteria and the two sets. I think we're doing uh, very well on, on the learning one and working conditions. I think there has been a, a, a general raise in, in, in matching uh, the aspirations of this, of this uh, um, criteria. We need still to work on the framework conditions and governance is, is one of these. Uh, so there is still uh, a role for the framework and, and, uh, and our collective job is to continue to implement it. Thank you. And yes, thank you. And uh, this was a little help to whoever was still answering the question on the, <laughs> on the criteria and Sorry, the implementation. <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, indeed, so thank you for setting a bit the scene for this uh, for this uh, discussion. And um, of course, the, uh, the the framework is a very important instrument, but it doesn't work alone. And there are also, um, uh, the, for example, the ILO has uh, been interested in quite an effective apprenticeships for for a long time now. And uh, just a few days ago, the ILO's International Labour Conference concluded discussions on the role and importance of apprenticeships, um, that uh, their their importance for reducing unemployment and addressing addressing labour market needs that have been discussed just a few, a few minutes ago, and, um, and this led to a new recommendation. So I would like to ask uh, Srinivas uh, if you could tell us a bit about the similarities and differences between these two instruments, so the um, fra European framework from one side and the ILO standards, and the rationale of the ILO action consider is global context. Thank you very much, Luca. Um, thank you, um, all the co members of the Alliance, uh, and congratulations on completion of the 10 years of its uh, uh, glorious uh, work. Um, this is truly inspirational, as, as we heard from the speakers. Um, for the ILO, uh, also this year, we had a very, very important discussion on the apprenticeship, uh, double discussion, which ended in uh, uh, a new recommendation just 10 days ago. Uh, clearly indicating the constituents, uh, uh, governments, employers, and workers from the 187 countries, indicating the priority and the preference that the apprenticeship deserves. In fact, uh, this uh, apprenticeship recommendation that was just adopted is filling a, a gap, a regulatory, specific regulatory gap of nearly 48 years at the international level. Uh, apart from the European framework, um, there was uh, uh, not really a framework uh, or a recommendation after one of the previous recommendations of the ILO was repealed. So, as also mentioned by colleagues this morning, uh, in fact, uh, the European framework provided a lot of inspiration to this uh, recommendation that was just adopted by the ILO uh, for the reason that uh, this is the later uh, instrument that has the benefit of uh, really uh, going through the European framework and all its experiences. And we at the Secretariat, at the ILO Secretariat, have uh, taken a lot of uh, uh, provisions from the uh, instrument, from the European framework. Uh, so therefore, you can expect that there are many, many similarities. I will also slightly highlight what are the differences. First, you know, the similarities. Uh, the main similarities are to ensure quality apprenticeships. So the quality elements are, um, in many ways, very, very common. Um, for example, you know, the ILO standard, as you all uh, know, is negotiated instrument by the 187 governments, employers, and workers' organizations. So there was quite an intense debate. You know, it's a four years of work. Last two years, it has been discussed and adopted just 10 days ago. Uh, some of the elements, for example, on the job and off the job training to be part of the apprenticeships, uh, it may sound very um, familiar to uh, Europe, but in other parts of the world where informal apprenticeships take place, in some parts, you know, there is no off-the-job learning. Most of the uh, most of the apprenticeships in informal economy is on the job. So therefore, this recommendation prescribes that there should be on-the-job and off-the-job learning. Apprenticeship should be remunerated, otherwise financially compensated. Apprenticeship should lead to a recognized qualification. 
and uh, crucially very important is the role of social partners in all its stages of apprenticeships development implementation monitoring and evaluation and uh, flexible learning pathways career guidance these are some of the elements that you find many many similarities between the european framework and the ilo standard what are the differences uh, when you see the differences it's interesting actually i was going through both the instruments very carefully we have been going through for the past four years actually so uh, the, the main differences are elaboration in the later instrument by the ilo uh, most of these most of these measures uh, are already covered in the european framework but if you see the ilo standard now uh, detailed specific measures have been uh, elaborated for example if you see on protection of apprentices there is a specific section in the recommendation now uh, going in quite detail you know what what are the various protection measures uh, that should be put in place just to mention that the apprentices should receive adequate remuneration not required to work hours that exceeds the limits are entitled to holidays with adequate remuneration entitled to absence due to illness have access to paid maternity or paternity leave or parental leave this kind of elaboration obviously the european framework has left it to the national regulation whereas in order to take care of the variety of contexts all over the world uh, this has to be uh, this was elaborated by the constituents so that there is guidance available to the member states in respect of their level of development what the recommendation should provide for just, uh, just i'm just referring to one section but uh, many sections like this for example uh, some of those uh, measures are introduced for the first time on specific agreements uh, specific measures relating to um, national regulations uh, similarly on uh, promoting equality diversity and social inclusion and also issues relating to um, <coughs> eliminating discrimination uh, violence harassment and exploitation at workplace a uh, number of uh, these measures have been elaborated and some of these may be of interest to you also if you are uh, for example revising your national legislation or national framework it could be a, a guiding a guiding reference uh, where it is uh, silent in the eu framework in the terms of uh, detailing uh, you will find it in the uh, ilo recommendation thank you thank you shrinivas was uh it was found very interesting and it is interesting to see how these instruments are complementary to each other and also how you know they help building and developing further also other instruments than have. now that we saw these instruments at european international level i would like to dive in in some concrete practices and see how the quality uh, criteria that are established by the framework defined by the, the framework are implemented in member states so um, carl i know that uh, in flanders there's been a recent reform of apprenticeships can you tell us more about the reform and how the quality standards have been integrated to indeed secure quality apprenticeships thank you Yes, well, first of all, it's not a very recent reform. Uh, we started a reform in 2015, which was actually a, a very a very interesting period because it was two years after the uh, establishment of the alliance and three years before the, the, the framework was um, was voted. And within the, the or starting from 2015 until 2018, we um, made a parallel in the, the dialogue on the, the framework and a parallel in the in the in, in, in the legislation in Flanders in order to, to get these things integrated. And I think we, we really succeeded in, in meeting most of the aspects of the framework with our uh, new system of dual learning. Um, if we go back to the system before 2015, of course, we had a, an apprenticeship system. And like every country, we, uh, we have an apprenticeship system dating back to the, to the Middle Ages. But the apprenticeship system in Flanders wasn't really adapted to the, to the needs of today. The apprenticeship system wasn't, was really focused on, let's say, performing labor um, and not learning anything or, or learning aspect was not very central to our uh, apprenticeship system. That we changed in 2015, or better say 2018, into a real learning system. And if we go back to the framework and we focus on some aspects of it, we I think three for us were crucial to, to, to focus on. First of all, um, we introduced a recognition system of companies um, just to give these companies a label of uh, a qualitative company for uh, apprenticeships. And for us it was important because these students, they, um, they stay for, let's say, 60% of their learning time in the company, so we should have some, um, some, some 
some guarantee that these companies are able to provide the training, that they have the ability, the capacity to provide the training, that they also have the uh, uh, possibility to pay the remuneration of the students. Um, and therefore, we introduced this, this, this recognition system. And it was revolutionary in Flanders because we before that we didn't have uh, any any system at all, and we all uh, we only relied on the the, 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 the good intentions of, of the company. Let's say um, a second aspect that we uh, think is crucial for uh, the quality in in, in 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 the apprenticeship system in Flanders is that we um, try to make. Um, or that we try to install uh, an, an, a system of curriculum design in which educational partners and social partners are both involved in 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 in, in the same way. Um, when we when we uh, construct a curriculum, we um, we have these social partners around the table and they introduce us in the, the competences that are needed to start as a beginning professional in a certain profession. But we also have our educational partners because we also want to train students. Um, who are critical civilians in, 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 in the union, who are critical, um, critical people in, 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 the, in the labor market and who can be mobile in the labor market. Because when a company closes, then these students, they, have to, they, they need to have these, these competences to uh, transfer their skills to another company, to another maybe sector. So that was th for us, that the involvement of both partners is really crucial. And then the third aspect uh, that we think is, is, is central to our apprenticeship system is a very close monitoring system. A monitoring system both on the workplace and on the educational uh, uh, provider. So we have a shared uh, inspectorate, uh, an educational inspectorate, and uh, uh, let's say a labor market inspectorate. And they, um, they every five years, they try to, to evaluate the, 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 the working places that are uh, involved in our apprenticeship system and also the schools that are um, uh, offering these apprenticeship courses. And I think with these three, uh, with these three uh, uh, aspects that we can take a huge step forward in, 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 in guaranteeing the quality of the system in, in, in Flanders and keeping in line with, uh, with the framework that was developed in 2018. Thank you. Uh, it was uh, very interesting to hear about the, the reform, and we will come back on it a little bit later on. And Sophie, uh, now also to discuss another another practice and a uh, bit a different level. Uh, Sophie, you'll be managing the Skills to Power project, which uh, I understand aims to strengthen the role of national uh, social partners and that providers to build skills intelligence in the electric electricity sector. Can you tell us more about this project? Yes, thank you very much. Good afternoon to, to everybody. Maybe uh, before explaining um, too much into details the, the, the skills to power project, I would like to, to explain from where I'm speaking. So I'm uh, working for Industrial Europe Trade Union Federation, which, which is a, a trade union federation representing workers in, uh, in diverse sectors, such as industry, energy, and also mining industry. And uh, yeah, we represent around 7 million workers in Europe. Um, we work uh, at different level with this uh, trade union federation at the national level level, but we also work with the employers at the national and, and European level. Uh, as you can imagine, as representing the, the workers in the industry, we work a lot on the just transition uh, agenda, if I may say. So for us, uh, the skills and the transformation of jobs are, are really at the heart of, of all the, the work we are doing now. Um, and uh, the, of the focus on the skill is very much important because for the moment we think that could be the acid eel of the, of the Green Deal uh, for the moment, which is a kind of a problem. But yeah, as I said, uh, we represent lots of sector, but we represent also uh, the electricity sector, so I will uh, talk about this sector more specifically, so I can uh, also highlight some, uh, some very concrete uh, example linked to a, a very concrete sector. Uh, yeah, electricity sector, as you can imagine also, uh, the jobs and employment uh, in the electricity sector, sector are changing uh, much faster than uh, expecting to the massive electrification. So the, there is uh, cur currently a massive changes in this sector and also a massive uh, demand for skills, for workers, uh, etc. And uh, we are working with the employers uh, at, the, at the European level, also with another trade union federation which is representing the public service, so EPSU. And uh, we have uh, uh, lots of dialogue with them, we discuss about the challenges, etc. But also with the help of the European Commission and DG AMPL, we had the chance to uh, work on very concrete projects. 
uh, this last year, I would say this 10 last years. And uh, I would like to, to highlight maybe three outcomes that has led us to, to this uh, skills to power project afterwards. First outcome is that uh, we uh, have um, conducted research, etc., showing, and it's not uh, exactly only for the uh, electricity sector, but we are seeing massive skills gap. Uh, I said earlier that we are facing now cu uh, currently lots of, uh, of um, uh, big changes in the electricity sector regarding skills, but we also see that there is huge skills gaps between what is offered, but also what is uh, needed on the ground, if I may say. Second uh, result, I would say, or uh, outcome of, of the, the previous project is that we are also seeing that sometimes uh, we do not have opportunities to put together the right stakeholders all together. I mean the social partners, of course, but also social partners with that providers, local authorities, etc. The previous speakers has explained a very uh, good example of, of good dialogue, but this is not happening in all countries. So this is also uh, one of the, the things we have, um, we have found when we were looking at what's happening in the different countries in the electricity sector. And the third uh, thing I would like to say regarding uh, this specific sector is that, of course, uh, the electricity uh, workforce, if I may say, is educated through a variety of means, but uh, of course apprenticeships prove to be the most effective training approach in the electricity sector. So we are uh, putting a lot of, of focus on apprenticeship also in, the, in this sector. So based on these different uh, results, if I may say, uh, we have developed recently a joint project uh, with the employers and the other trade union federation to, to face these different challenges. And we have uh, conducted this skills to power project, um, which was focusing on trying to, to help the capacity building on the uh, national level. So it was not a huge EU project uh, with very general messages. We really, uh, go, uh, we really went on the national level to see what was happening what was the, the concrete problems, uh, also to have a granular mapping of the skills needs, etc. Because it's also great to have uh, EU research showing the skills gap, etc. But this is very much important to also go at the national and regional level, because we know this is where uh, everything is happening, of course. Um, so that was very much uh, the focus, to, to go on the national level. And we have conducted also more uh, targeted projects in five countries, France, Italy, Spain, Hungary, and Sweden. Sweden, and we have uh, worked with uh, trying to put uh, around the table, if I may say, the right stakeholders who sometimes do not have the opportunity to talk, and they have worked during a different workshop to uh, develop a, a, um, a national roadmap regarding the skills in the electricity sector, with also the idea of, uh, if I link that to the apprenticeship, uh, the idea of uh, having joint uh, agreement on apprenticeship at the national level. So that was really one of the, the the key focus to try to put together the right stakeholders. Maybe just saying that for some of you will be, okay, we already have that on the national level, but really uh, the, 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 our partners, they have said that was really great to uh, also meet sometimes people that we are not used to, to meet. So creating this kind of opportunity for us was really uh, very, was very much important. Uh, I would like to, to maybe finish my point um, on, on three things. The first is that one also of the outcome was uh, to, to say that it's very much important to focus on youth uh, and the young generation, but um, this is very much important to also put the fo focus on retraining uh, the existing workforce, especially when we talk about just transition, job to job transition, and in the electricity sector, as I said, everything is changing very fast. So it's very much important to keep everyone on board and do not, left, uh, do not leave us, uh, anyone behind, <coughs> if I may say. So that's very much important to have this kind of, of, um, of thing uh, accessible to everyone, not only uh, on use, but also on the existing workforce. Second thing I would like to say is uh, when we talk about apprenticeship, it's also very much important to have a uh, high target. And uh, we have that in, in, in different uh, framework at the national EU level. But we see also in other country uh, that um, this is very much important to, foc to, um, to link the, the public money to this kind of, uh, of uh, target of apprenticeships. We see that, for example, in the 
IRA in the USA, they have said, okay, we are going to, yeah, if I can be brief, uh, give you public money only if you can have a good quality apprenticeship uh, in your company. So that's something that could be uh, very interesting. And last thing is that uh, we also have uh, to link all of this stuff with the right to training for the workers, which is, uh, of course, very much important when we talk about the, the just transition. Thank you, Sophie. You took um, you mentioned a lot of different interesting points that also we come back in the next part of the conversation. Um, I would like now to go back to the Slido, if it's possible to see the results. If you haven't voted, you can still do it. Um, so indeed, so we see the most implemented to the least implemented. So most implemented involvement social partners, then written agreement, work and health and safety conditions, paying compensation, and last support for companies. So uh, it's, we have almost 100 votes, so it's interesting. Um, indeed, we can see what is the right uh, ranking. And indeed, uh, sorry, is, was the next question again? The next slide? So. Uh, actually, uh, so written agreement, work and health and safety condition and paying compensation, uh, they are mostly implemented, uh, or the most implemented, uh, or the fifth, and then involvement of social partners and support for companies as the least implemented. So maybe some of you got it uh, correctly or some others might be surprised to, to see this result and given the, what we saw before, probably you had a different idea of which uh, one was the most implemented. Um, and as Chiara was mentioning before, you can see that the first three are indeed in learning and working conditions, while the other three, the other two are on the framework condition that as Chiara was mentioning, uh, uh, there is still uh, some work to be done. The results are based on a report that was published by the European Commission in 2021 that assessed the progress of uh, made by member states in implementation of the recommendation. So if you're curious, you can go on the AFA website and you can find the report there where you have a lot of information about the criteria and how they've been implemented. But uh, among, of course, uh, looking at the framework conditions, one uh, important uh, essential criteria, what essential element of success for uh, apprenticeships is governance, a good governance in particular. And this has been mentioned already by several speakers today. But uh, Sophie, you were just mentioning your project that you bring together different uh, stakeholders, the right stakeholders. Can you tell us more about what you think needs to be done about governance of apprenticeships? Yes, thank you for this question. Um, uh, yeah, that was already said several times before uh, before me uh, this afternoon. But uh, yeah, as representing a social partner, I would say that of course social partner must be at the er uh, earth of the of all this uh, this stuff, if I may say. This is very much important because we are the experts. We know. Uh, I, I mean, on the European level, but more specifically on the, at the national level, of course, we are there uh, to to agree uh, uh, at the EU at the sectoral level about a set of competencies, uh, trying to also identify the good education and training paths and also the qualification needed to to acquire uh, these uh, skills. Uh, we also have a big role to play in attract, uh, in having attractive um, education framework. This is very much important. And a quality apprenticeship contract could be also very much attractive and we have a role to play in that, in that matter. I would like maybe to also um, give you an example of what we have done once again in the electricity sector. It's not about apprenticeship, it's about traineeship. I know this is not the same, but uh, we have agreed at the, at the European le level about a European quality framework for traineeship that was signed by the European social partners. Having in mind that when we sign as EU social partners, then our members at the national level have to implement it. So we have signed a very interesting uh, uh, European quality framework for traineeship that was uh, focusing on a good quality traineeship with social protection, good working condition, link that also to the educational pathway uh, for the different uh, students, etc. And uh, I'm um, explaining that because I think it's a good uh, and concrete example of things that we can do as social partners this kind of agreement uh, and maybe this is something we, we will have to do uh, in that sector but also in other sector on apprenticeship and that will be a follow-up. To reply to your question about um, the governance, of course, uh, we think that it should be governed at all levels by the, so the social partners, but of course with the public authorities and the VET providers. Once again, it's, it's very easy to say that, but very concretely what we demand, that was also mentioned by Ludovic, Ludovic I, say, I think before um, me this afternoon, we have to be involved in the designing of the uh, apprenticeship policy. This is very much important, but also in the implementation of the policy uh, 
and also uh, in the, at the company level to uh, define exactly the rules, the roles of the different stakeholders involved in the, sc in the schemes, etc. Something that is very much important. And then a uh, last remark maybe uh, is and probably the most important one is that we also think that, that all these apprenticeship um, schemes should be built on stable foundation on the basis of law but also of collective bargaining agreements. This is very much important that when we talk about this, we have also in mind the collective bar bargaining agreements on apprenticeship, which for us is very much important. I stop yes. here. Thank you, Sophie. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you indeed. Uh, and uh, social partners indeed is important. It's interesting to see that there is the perception that is one of the most implemented criteria, and so they are very involved, probably because there is a lot of talking about it. Uh, but then uh, I would like to ask to, um, Srinivas uh, what role the social partners can play then to ensure why it's important to involve them and how they can best ensure the quality standards and apprenticeships are implemented and respected. Uh, thank you, Loka. I think uh, the message is very clear uh, and the lesson we can learn from Europe, particularly from all of you, that if apprentices have to succeed, the involvement of social partners is critical, is crucial in many respects, but particularly in three respects, involving social partners, representation of social partners, and consultation with social partners. While deliberating on the new recommendation uh, at the ILO, uh, the social partners and government have extensively dealt with many, many, many paragraphs, both last year and this year, on the role and involvement of social partners. Role of social partners in designing and implementing, monitoring, um, and evaluating apprenticeships, you all recognize, I think, uh, some of the best experiences we have in Europe, without any doubt. That is one of the major drawbacks that we are seeing in many parts of the world where the role of social partners is not fully realized to the extent that it is required. Uh, you know, we, we listen to, for example, you have uh, the Business Europe and also the ETUC. They are very, very active partners in this framework, uh, uh, recommendation implementation as well as the alliance. Uh, you don't see those uh, situations in uh, other parts of the world, particularly developing world. That is our effort to really encourage uh, governments and also employers and support employers and workers organizations to play a very active role. Uh, so the recommendation, in fact, has dealt with where the employers, workers, organizations should be involved in decision making. In fact, one of the, one of the uh, paragraphs very clearly says, in fact, uh, probably very strong, actually, even in regulating, it says uh, members, that is member states, uh, should designate one or more public authorities responsible for regulating apprenticeships in which representative employers and workers organizations should be represented, even on regulatory authorities. This is just uh, uh, one example, but in all aspects of uh, apprenticeship development, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation, where uh, employers and workers organizations have to be in a very important role of decision making, and where they have to be represented, for example, in public authorities, just I mentioned, and similarly, where they have to be consulted on a number of things, consultation by governments, when establishing occupation-specific or general standards for apprenticeships, and the development measures to create an enabling environment for promoting apprenticeships, which could include setting national goals and allocating resources for apprenticeships, uh, establishing sectoral or occupational skills bodies, implementing effective and sustainable financing models, and also providing incentives and support services. Quite a lot has also been discussed on how to support MSMEs, for example. Uh, also, the, where intermediaries are required, where the small uh, uh, enterprises are not able to provide off-the-job training, uh, how the intermediaries can support. So, you know, involvement of uh, both the employers and workers' organizations is fundamental and crucial, and, and we at the ILO, in fact, we are very much uh, keen to promote this, also learning from Europe and how we can uh, replicate Europe experience in uh, many other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Shinivas, uh, for outlining how these stakeholders are important at different levels and different uh, stages of apprenticeships. But it's also great to hear that uh, Europe is leading the way, is providing a good example for other countries as well. Um, then, uh, looking at, talking about examples, uh, we'd like to ask Carl if you could tell us more about the governance system in Flanders. Uh, this has been also impacted by the reform, and uh, this uh, you mentioned already before, you gave some hints, but maybe we can dig a bit more into it. Yes, thank you. Um, 
Well, no need to say that for Flanders also the social partners are, are, are really key. Um, but we in Flanders, we, um, we mainly focus on the cooperation between educational partners and social partners because I think that both partners are uh, playing the, the, a very heavy role in our apprenticeship system. Um, in order to, 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 to give them a, a shared table, uh, we installed in 2019 the so-called Flemish Partnership on Dual Learning. And the Flemish Partnership is, um, as, well, as, we, as, as, as the word al already mentioned, it, it, it's, it's a shared table where educational partners meet with social partners and we meet every month. Every month we try to, um, to, to, to reflect on uh, reforms that were did in the apprenticeship system. We try to uh, monitor the, the system. We give advice to, the, to both ministers because it's in France it's also a shared competence between the Minister of Work and the Minister of, of Education. But of course, the, the real work isn't done uh, at that level. The real work is done at the sectoral level, and therefore we also introduced the so-called sectoral partnerships. And every sector has a partnership. Every sector has this kind of shared table where the sectoral partners meet with the educational partners. And these sectoral partnerships, they have like four, four main competent, uh, four main responsibilities. First of all, they um, they are responsible for the training of the mentor in uh, the company in their sector. So they, uh, that way they, they, can, they, can, uh, they can install a, a qualitative system in the company and they can keep up with the quality of the, of the mentor. Second, they are responsible for attracting new companies. So they have to look for uh, opportunities in the sector. They have to look for uh, new companies in order to, and, and they try to inform them and they try to uh, keep them at or, or put them on board. Then thirdly, um, as I mentioned earlier, they are uh, also responsible for the, the development of the curriculum, uh, not only for the development of, of the curriculum, but also to keep the to keep the curriculum up to date. So if something changes in, 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 in the job market, which uh, is, 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 of course, in every sector very relevant, they are also responsible to translate these changes into the, into the curriculum and to put uh, these changes in, in, into, into practice. And then, um, Last but not least, I have to have to check. Uh, yeah, of course, they are uh, also responsible for the for the recognition of the company. Um, uh, on, on on the central level, we provided a, a recognition framework, but of course, they have to check the framework within practice. They have to go to the company. They have to check if they if if the company uh, will meet every needs that uh, that is in the in the framework. And these sectoral partnerships, they are really, for us, the engine of the apprenticeship system. This is where the, the, the real work is done, and we, we, we heavily rely on these partnerships. And they also signalize uh, uh, aspects that are important to the Flemish partnership and the Flemish partnership. They uh, are in close contact with both ministers, so therefore we have a quite direct line between what's happening on the labor markets, in the apprenticeships, and uh, what should be translated into law. Thank you, Carl. That's, that's really inspiring and uh, concretizes very much all the discussion that uh, happened till now. Um, then for the last question of this second round, I will uh, turn to Chiara and ask to look at the future and ask a bit what are the plans for the Commission, so the next steps that the Commission will take for the implementation of the framework. Uh, thank you very much, Luca. So I would say two things mainly. One is continue full on on the implementation of the framework because we have seen that uh, we are we have hit the the right points, but some of them may need some some support. And I want to reassure everyone that the support services of the alliance are alive and kicking. We're not planning on discontinuing them any any time soon. It's just that the support needs to change because we have seen that at the systemic level we we are going in the right direction and member states have uh, really made a lot of inroads but we might need to look at some specific issues and for this the uh, the EAFA uh, support services are really offering also punctual ways and tools to continue uh, to advance we, we've had webinars on uh, in the care sector to look at a very uh, specific uh, sector for example we are moving a lot towards uh, also regional uh, level and we're very happy to see that among the new pledges we have also many 
uh, from the regional level. Uh, we have talked about how to make apprenticeships more inclusive, also to reach out for, to people uh, with disabilities. We are talking a lot about green and, and how apprenticeships can support the green transition. So we really think that um, uh, we're very happy to continue to provide the support, but looking at uh, more specific challenges. Uh, and the second way is connecting the dots. Um, because we have done a lot uh, and, and we've seen many things have been mentioned, uh, uh, the launch of the alliance, then the youth guarantee, uh, then the uh, framework, then the VET recommendation. So a lot is happening. But if, if one thing that we are learning very clearly and loudly from the European Year of Skills is that we all have to continue learning throughout our lives. So how all these different tools that we have can support this vision and can support this, this purpose. We have uh, the Pact for Skills that came uh, much later than the Alliance for Apprenticeship, but is showing an incredible amount of support with 1,500 organizations involved. So how can we leverage uh, this incredible network that we have so that we can, apprenticeships can have be one of the tools that can be used to upskill and reskill in a way that is effective for people and for companies. How can we use apprenticeships to attract talent from abroad? We see that a lot of brilliant minds from outside of Europe come and study in our universities, but we would like them also to come and study in our in our companies, in our vet institutions. And so this is something that we need to reflect. And of course, the role of apprenticeships for adults in an upskilling and reskilling uh, perspective. So I think we have uh, a work cut out for us and, then, and there is a lot that we can do. And, and I'm really happy that we are here all today to celebrate the achievements, but also uh, look at the future. Thanks, Chiara. That's uh, exciting. There's a lot of work to be done still, but a lot of have been accomplished already. And um, so I think we have time for, for questions, so maybe we can open the floor. I see there is already a hand raised. Uh, there are the microphone are arriving, and so if others also can start booking. Okay, there is another question there. Fantastic. Yes, thank you very much. I'm Agnes Roman from the European Trade Union Confederation, and it's a very interesting discussion. And I would like to ask uh, Chiara from the Commission that uh, uh, are the countries preparing any kind of new commitments? Because it's very impressive that there are 400 pledges from companies, social partners, civil society organizations, providers, but the, the countries provided their national commitments 10 years ago, and a lot has changed. Are they doing anything? Are they um, uh, subscribing any new uh, duties for themselves? And in relation to the ILO recommendation, the EU countries now have two important documents, the quality framework of apprenticeship and the ILO recommendation. And uh, do the countries have any kind of reporting duty towards the ILO? Because uh, we, we from the trade union side, we are very happy that the ILO recommendation is adding to the EU quality framework concerning gender the equality aspect concerning more rights for the uh, apprentices, but um, how it will be monitored. And I would like to ask also the colleagues from national level and sectoral level, do you want to, how do you plan to focus on the implementation of the ILO recommendation? Thank you. Shall we answer to this one first and then we take uh, the others? Or? Sure, so uh, maybe I, I can go first and uh, the short answer is yes, yes, they are uh, uh, updating their commitments, but I would also like to say that the main commitment of, of the member states is the recommendation. So if, if we really work together to fully implement uh, uh, what is there, I think we will definitely advance. Uh, and then we see also that they are reporting on uh, the VET recommendation, the 2020 VET recommendation. And of course, apprenticeships are part of VET and the governance system is part of VET. So we are advancing with them at different uh, uh, levels. And as I mentioned before, we are going uh, one level down at, at the regional level, because that was, I think, w what we were missing uh, to, to really get to, uh, to the ground and to the territory, considering also that in many member states, um, that and in general education is dealt with more at a local level. So I think we are all working towards uh, running after and also anticipating that the new challenges uh, that we are facing. Uh, thank you. Um, as far as the recommendation, ILO recommendation is concerned, um, yes, it is uh, not a convention, so it's a recommendation applicable to all the 187 member states. 
including uh, the 27 uh, EU member states. So as part of the ILO's uh, regular reporting mechanism under the general uh, survey, uh, so the countries will be required to report uh, on the implementation of the recommendation. Thank you. Okay. I saw that there was a question uh, there in the video. Uh, yes. And then there are other questions there. And I saw another hand there. Thanos. Hello. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm from Greece. My name is Thanos Agatakis. I work at the Ministry of Education. Greece is running an apprenticeship scheme, an adult apprenticeship scheme. What I would like uh, to ask or just note, one of the 14 criteria refers to mobility of the apprentices. Mobility as an apprentice, not as an adult with an Erasmus Plus program. Uh, do we have uh, something uh, to report on this? I mean, what is the status of the implementation of the mobility of apprentices? And if there is something that we should expect. Thank you. Yes, maybe we can take a few questions and then we answer this, okay. Hello, uh, my name is Sergio Alegre from uh, Fundesplay. It's in, in Catalonia, Spain. It's more than a question, no, it's a question with a reflection first. I mean, I really like it, the, the, your presentation about how you engage the companies and your recognition, and I think probably it's a very, very good example. But let's have a thought, I propose you, all of you. Shouldn't we go a little bit more there? Should not be an obligation of the companies to work for that? I mean, never in history before, at least in the European Union, we have put so much money in companies. Next generation, blah, 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 blah. But I love it. And why it's not compulsory, like they, it's compulsory to pay taxes, to pay the social insurance, and other aspects that they do it like we do it because it's compulsory, not because for fun, to make this agreement at the European level. Because why we have to public authorities for a social good to run like, sorry, dogs behind them? It should be, I think, maybe one of the conclusions from this event or in the future. Thank you. Yeah, there is a question also on the back. I'm Susan from the National Society of Apprentices. Um, so I was looking up some statistics about um, pay. And for example, in Germany, the average cost of living on the low end is 1,698 euros. The average apprenticeship wage is 620 euros. And this is reflected in pretty much most countries across the EU. Um, is, are there any plans for the commitment for pay to be less about just the fact that we get paid and more about us receiving a fair wage? Um, maybe we can take these questions. There is, yes, and then we can uh, let me see if there are others. So there was a question on mobility. Chiara, maybe you want to... Yes, thank you very much. So on, on the mobility, uh, the uh, f FQA uh, has two references to mobility in the criterion. They're not mandatory. It's uh, a call to, to, to member states to incorporate elements of transnational mobility in their programs. And I think this is key uh, if we want uh, to, to, to have these opportunities, to have them in the program, in the curriculum, and to make sure that there are partner countries where you can exchange uh, the, uh, the, the, the apprentices themselves. Because, of course, to send someone, you have to have somebody who will receive them. And uh, Erasmus supports that. It's not a problem that they are uh, adults. Uh, it's not linked to the age. If you are in school and, and you are or in, in, uh, in a, a qualification of apprenticeships or VET or higher education, you can go on mobility. There are a number of reasons. And for there, I refer you to the excellent set of studies on this, on the obstacle to mobility. And one of the obstacles is that apprentices themselves are not that keen on going, especially for long, for long periods uh, uh, of uh, mobility abroad. Companies also 
have a little bit difficulties in uh, hosting apprentices. Language is a big barrier because we're not talking about going to study, but we're talking about going to the work floor and being integrated uh, in a company. So there are a number of issues. And uh, we are working on these issues uh, also uh, in an upcoming um, proposal on uh, learning mobility overall, not specifically for apprentices or vet, but o uh, overall for all the different education and training sector and, and for adult learning. Uh, so these are uh, things that we are trying to address. but cannot be addressed only at EU level. So what we can do is to, is to try to smooth out the obstacles, try to strengthen the support, but this very much depends on the agreement between the companies and the institutions to exchange uh, the students. It's, it's precious, uh, it's not mandatory uh, at the moment, uh, and we continue to keep it uh, on the table as a very important issue. The same goes uh, in a way for pay. I mean, the important, it's very important that we have this as a clear uh, criteria and a clear demand, but once again, it is for the member states to see within the national context, within the uh, sectoral social dialogue or collective bargaining, how to address this. Because as you know, this is not an issue that can be uh, solved uh, at the EU level. Thank you. And of course, everyone is welcome to join in. Um, for the other question from Sergio about making it compulsory, I think maybe we can hear uh, Carl and Sophie on that. So we have the perspective of government and the companies. Yes, well, um, in Flanders we chose not to make it compulsory, but we tried to provide uh, enough incentives to uh, to convince companies to take to take part in the in, in the system. And I think that an, a, a good incentive framework is um, sometimes more convincing for these companies because then then you can rely on the engagement of the company and on the the capacity of the company. A company should decide for themselves in or if if he or she is is able to to take uh, to take up an apprentice, and if she uh, or or he is, is is able to provide the training because you. you you really have to rely on on human capital. You have to rely on the capacity of the, of the personnel working in the company. So, for us, it's, it wasn't a very good idea to make it uh, compulsory for every company, and uh, because I think that would also put quite a lot of, of, of stress on these uh, small and medium enterprises uh, and these these one man businesses. Um, we, we we chose the way of uh, of providing a good incentive framework uh, to to convince our companies. Yeah, thank you also for the, the, the question and the, the good uh, reflection regarding that. As trade union uh, representing the industry, we also think that <laughs> this is something that could be compulsory and we link that to what I explained. Not compulsory as such, but I mean, uh, now we have this uh, industrial strategy in Europe uh, called the Net Zero Industry Act that will help companies to access public funds. And we think that if we do not link that to social conditionalities, link to good quality job, but also having targets for apprenticeship at the company level, then it will not work. We will need a social pillar also for this Net Zero Industry Act. And uh, in this like social pillar, we think that apprenticeship could, could be part of this, uh, this uh, package, if I may say. This is very much important for us also to even uh, social conditionalities when we talk about public money, very much important. And this is linked to the, the second uh, thing that was mentioned regarding pay. We do not want, we just do not want just apprenticeship. We want good quality apprenticeship with good pay, good social protection, and lots of other good. Uh, uh, and quality criteria. Uh, this is very much important that we continue to monitor the working condition of the apprenticeship and the uh, schemes, if I may say. And pay is, of course, uh, central to the link to that because this could also uh, lead to a social dumping inside the company if you have a different pay, etc. So that's something that we have to be, um, uh, yeah, that we have to take uh, care, of course. She was for. Please jump in. Yeah, thank you. Look, I just want to reflect on a couple of points uh, colleagues mentioned about mobility and, and also the obligation of companies. Um, not uh, um, clearly from the European uh, experience, but also internationally. Um, the ILO recommendation also encourages uh, promoting the recognition of apprenticeship qualifications, both nationally, regionally, and internationally. That is encouraging mobility wherever it is possible. <laughs> Um, on the obligation of companies, we have some countries that have mandated that that have uh, obligated that the companies uh, shall undertake apprenticeships, and this is in Asia. 
Um, but uh, what we realize that by just obligating, uh, there is no guarantee that the apprenticeships will succeed because that is the experience of those countries that have obligated. They do not have the biggest success rate in terms of apprenticeships can compare to other uh, situations. I'm not saying it's not uh, uh, either way, uh, this way or that way, but what we realize is that the creating enabling environment for apprentices to succeed, creating incentives for companies as well as the apprentices, and even addressing the image of the apprenticeship system. There are several issues that surround uh, whether we obligate a company uh, or not to undertake apprenticeship. Similarly, what we also noticed, for example, increasingly when we talk of lifelong learning, uh, how adults uh, will be encouraged and supported to take apprenticeships uh, within the companies. Obviously, this is um, the, the, it could be the same company that the person is working or uh, maybe another uh, affiliated companies. So how does it work? You know, these are three issues and what we realize from the ILO, uh, innovations and partnerships are very important. For example, we are implementing uh, skills programs in 61 countries, but one of the large programs, for example, with the European Union funding we are implementing in Bangladesh, uh, very uh, good innovations are happening on apprenticeships. Similarly with Flanders, my colleague sitting next to me, uh, with Flanders, we are implementing a, a program on adult apprenticeships, how to promote adult apprenticeships, a number of seven research pieces we have conducted in collaboration with Flanders on what are the various aspects that need to be addressed and how to create that enabling environment, also working closely with the workers and employers organizations. Thank you. So it's an interesting discussion, definitely, on, on this point. So I would like to thank our speaker. We have got uh, the end of our discussion. So thank you very much again for joining. And uh, please uh, extend a round of applause for our speakers. Thank you very much. You can, yeah. so. It was a pleasure to be here. And I leave the floor back to Vicky for moving on to the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. Um, so um, we have arrived at the point of the coffee break, uh, which is an important part of the agenda, of course, because this is about uh, also informal networking bet between all the members of the Alliance. Um, so um, I'd just like to conclude this first session by thanking the speakers on the last panel, but also all the speakers uh, throughout uh, this morning, the new members who've joined, um, and inviting all of you who are here um, to join us for the coffee break. Uh, and we will uh, start again at 10 to 5. Um, so if you can be back here by quarter to 5, so 16.45. Uh, and before that, uh, do um, take the opportunity to network uh, with everybody. And I look forward to seeing you at the coffee in a moment. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome back from the coffee break, everyone. I hope you use the opportunity uh, to meet um, some more uh, people at the conference and uh, meet uh, some more of the Alliance uh, members. Um, so uh, now for the next session uh, of our program, uh, we have the second panel, uh, which is focusing on apprenticeships as a means to secure skilled employees. Um, and I'm delighted that the moderator for this session is Robert Plummer, who is Senior Advisor at Business Europe. And I will hand over directly to you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much, uh, Vicky. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, and I'm very pleased to, to be able to moderate this, uh, this second session. We've already had a very rich <laughs> discussion, I think, in the first uh, part of the meeting, the first panel, and I'm sure we'll continue that as well with the panelists that we have uh, here too. Um, firstly, maybe shortly by, by way of introduction, I think uh, this was also referred to in, in uh, the, the, the first part of the session we had as well, the increasing importance of, of skills and skills as a factor of uh, strategic planning for companies, of, of competitiveness, of innovation. Um, I think increasingly we're looking not just at skills in relation to labor markets, but in terms of the wider societal impact, participation in societies. We think of the green and digital transitions often. It's a key topic uh, that we talk about. We look, need to look as well at the role of, uh, of apprenticeships in that respect. So I think we see this growing role for, for skills, certainly in our societies and our workplaces, and apprenticeships in particular is a key, uh, a key part of that as well. So that's something that I think we, 
we will look at uh, in, in this panel and also not just from the perspective of um, uh, the maybe the subject specific content of, uh, of apprenticeships in terms of the uh, the specific occupational related aspects of the training, but also the more transversal skills uh, that apprenticeships are also very key at in terms of training uh, young people, but also adults alike, as we uh, also have uh, have touched upon. So I think uh, with that, and just before introducing the panel, I think we have also a Slido uh, poll to uh, just get the uh, brain cells going again after the coffee break. Um, so you can see here the, the question, um, what are employers' most urgent skills needs that could be addressed through apprenticeships? And we will look at the answers, I think, directly now. So if you could do this one now, please, and then we'll, um, we'll just have a quick uh, reflection on this. Very good. I think we had about a hundred people in the first one, so I'm just waiting to see how far the counter gets up. <laughs> um, at least as an indication. I think we're, we've got a couple of stable ones, I think, as the, the, the main one, the technical and, and highly specialized skills, and clear uh, second place as well, the soft and, and interpersonal skills, and indeed, I think that does reflect um, to, uh, to a very good extent what we see in, in terms of the, the reality of, of how employers view um, apprenticeships and uh, it is indeed, as I was saying, that combination of the two that makes it such a um, successful form of training, not only for the companies, but also, of course, uh, for the individuals as well. Thank you very much. And still 82 participating. This is also extre <laughs> extremely good. So thank you <laughs> to those here and, and those uh, online as well. So with that, um, I will then introduce our, uh, our panel. Um, first to my left is Adam Skokan from the Association of Virtual and Augmented Reality. Uh, Adam, you're very welcome. Um, Ad Adam's organization um, organizes in, in the, the Czech Republic the uh, Czech VR Fest, which is the biggest uh, such festival of its kind in, uh, in Central Europe. So Adam is our, our first speaker, and then we also have uh, Frederic Nolet from uh, Nestle, um, one of the very early, I think, also members of, uh, of the European Alliance, and uh, Frederic being uh, a committed HR professional of more than 30 years. And then we have Andre uh, Gyrenko from ECOVEM, which is one of the uh, European Centers of Vocational Excellence. So we'll hear a bit more from, from Andre about that in due course. And then on my far left, we have Kai Reinartz from the DGB Youth, which is the German, uh, the youth organization of the German uh, Confederation of, uh, of Trade Unions. So, with that, I will go first to Adam. Uh, you're the lucky one to, uh, to kick us off. Um, and for you, I would like to ask you um, if you see or what role could increasing the apprenticeship offer play in helping to address the current shortages that we see um, in your sector? And what do you think is needed to ensure that this can actually happen? for the for the introduction 
I would like to be short and specific, so I, that's the way I prefer. <laughs> so basically, I believe that uh, increasing the apprenticeships of work can definitely help address the current shortage of workers in the VR industry. Um, what we think is what is really important to lead by example. So to improve the image of the apprenticeships in, in Czech Republic, we would like to show that what's possible and what what we can do if we have the the opportunities and all the all the resources. Um, um, I'll introduce the organization somehow. So we are the association. We organize mainly events to to show public what virtual reality can do. What what's the tool for other industries, so how good is it and what you can actually do with it. And uh, we have uh, like a career development plan for the apprentices in our company. So uh, at, at the beginning, the, they are helping with the events, they are learning how to use the virtual reality. After that, they organize events themselves. So they are trying to uh, get in the process of organization. And after all, everything together, they are getting in the management positions. Here on the picture, you can see that's one of the events uh, for apprentices, one influencer in the middle, uh, that's uh, Czech YouTube Band, and uh, two apprentices on the right, uh, or on, on the left, they are from Ukraine, so um, they, the, the inclusion is really there. And uh, on, on the other side, you can see the apprentice, uh, even a, a woman, so we, we don't actually care w about the background, background of the apprentices. Uh, we care about what they really want to do and what, are, what is the motivation. Uh, and actually, it was the idea, their idea, to invite the influencer to the event, and it was great success. If I can have the next picture, yeah, this is my colleague Patrick. He's from Madagascar, and he had idea to invite the the former minister for health uh, for for an event, and he's presenting the application of human health, uh, the human anatomy. Um, but what basically what I wanted to show you by this picture is uh, the, that all we need is the motivation, the inner motivation of the apprentices. Uh, we give them opportunities, we give them tasks, resources, responsibility and appreciation and they perform perfectly. Uh, and if they perform perfectly, we, we have no problem giving them, them the wage they want or according with the, the wage of, of full-time employee, yeah. Uh, so uh, the key aspect of leading apprentice in our company is to listen to them, to listen to their voice and opinion. Basically, we have two ears and one mouth, so we listen all the time and work with their opinion, yeah. Basically, that's the key of success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. And indeed, I think what you said there about the motivation, it's all what, any aspect of learning, that's really one of the fundamental uh, things to be motivated to enjoy your learning. And thank you uh, very much indeed for that uh, that example. I'll turn then to, uh, to Frederic, who I think would also um, maybe comment on some of the initiatives that Nestle has, has been involved in, and in particular the, the Nestle Needs Youth Initiative. So please, Frederic. Thank you, and good, good afternoon. Uh, indeed, uh, in fact, uh, we are one of the founding partners of the uh, IFA, and at the same time, back in 2013, we also had realized that uh, uh, we, the level of youth unemployment was extremely low, uh, mainly in South Europe, and this is why we decided to launch an initiative that we call Nestle Needs Youth, that was based uh, mainly on helping uh, young people to be better prepared to enter the job market, and at the same time, uh, to increase uh, within our countries the number of apprentices and trainees because we believe in work-based learning and we believe that this was a great way for them to start uh, their career. 
So at that time, we committed that we will hire 20,000 uh, young people. And today, we are very happy to share that we have hired uh, more than 90,000 young people through, through uh, jobs, uh, apprentices, and, and trainees. And, um, and we also, at that time, had the, the feeling that uh, even if we are a, a quite sizable company, uh, we could not uh, solve this problem of youth unemployment. So we decided to launch, one year later, the Alliance for Youth. The Alliance for Youth is uh, companies that have the same objective as us, which is to really uh, help young people. So today, we started the Alliance for Youth with 14 companies in Europe. Today Today we have now a global alliance, so we extended also the initiative outside of Europe to the world and the alliance today encompasses more than 28 companies with whom we are trying to set up uh, action at country level to really have a broader impact. So um, this is what we, we launched uh, 10 years ago and this year we will also uh, uh, celebrate 10 years, 10 years of uh, success I must say because we have been able to implement uh, many uh, different uh, initiatives based on the country needs and on the uh, youth needs in, in the countries. We have uh, developed new apprenticeship schemes, for instance, depending, for instance, uh, uh, attracting young people to the food industry today is not a given. They would rather prefer to go to a more sexy uh, type of job. Uh, but in some countries, we have uh, set up uh, apprenticeship scheme um, as a food industry. So not only Nestle, but also we open this. Uh, and this is really successful. We had the case uh, in Spain. We had the case also uh, in Slovakia. Uh, in some other cases, we have also uh, set up an uh, apprenticeship scheme to really enlarge the uh, skills of the young people with the company from the Alliance for Youth. For instance, we call it Apprentice Swap in France. We have at the moment hired 14 uh, young people in combination uh, with uh, some companies like uh, ADECO, L'Oréal, NG uh, and Auchan. And uh, basically, the young person is spending one year within Nestlé, and then the following year uh, is spending with another company. So obviously, you get a double benefit in the same apprenticeship scheme, which I believe is very important for them. And also, I remember uh, when I look at the skill that was mentioned here, you got the technical skills, but soft skills is also something that indeed is extremely important. So when you have, as a young people, the opportunity to spend one year with one company, you really learn the soft skill in this company and the culture of the company. When you spend the other year in another company, you learn something different. Because uh, obviously all of our companies have a different way of uh, you know, uh, behaving. Uh, it's part of our culture. So these are the type of uh, uh, initiatives that we have been able to implement thanks to our initiative that uh, um, is not stopping today. <laughs> we are planning to continue for sure, uh, moving ahead. Thank you. Thank you Mike. very much, uh, Frederic. I mean, yes, please, round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> A very good example there of uh, not only what you're doing within Europe, but also partnerships outside, also bringing in the mobility dimension that we, we also touched on uh, previously as well. So thank you very much for that. And then Andre, um, if I turn to you now for the um, uh, European Centre of Vocational Excellence that you've been involved in in the area of microelectronics. Could you tell us a bit more about that, please, how that cooperation came to be about and who you're, who you're working with in this respect? Okay, thank you. Thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to, to speak at that uh, uh, remarkable event. I represent here a European uh, Centre of Vocational Excellence in the field of mit microelectronic. This is a, a sectoral COV, COVE, it's this abbreviation. It's a, a family of projects funded by Euro European Union through the Erasmus Plus scheme with the goal to structure and enable new um, um, generation of VET across the continent. Uh, sounds great. We focused on microelectronics because microelectronics is a critical enabling technology. We swim in microelectronics. Uh, we, if you just look around, in this room alone, I would count maybe 1,000 devices, microelectronics. But uh, 
Less than 10% of them made in Europe, and none of them made 100% of European components. Europe is lagging behind. Uh, this was uh, completely obvious in, in the time of, uh, uh, of uh, pandemic crisis, if you remember, because of the disruption in supply chains. Uh, for instance, European automotive sector was on, on hold for several weeks. We don't have production capacity. We don't have uh, technology, what is more important. As, as a result of this understanding that we're dependent, and this is critical technology, needs to be uh, um, uh, here on this ground, the European CHIP Act was signed in 2021. An integral part of this uh, act is the need to develop new skills and new competences in Europe in order to compensate for the, uh, at least ease this critical dependency. Uh, we were funded and devi devised even before this act, so we anticipated this development, but still this act uh, plays a guiding role for us. So we, uh, uh, as an activities, we have several uh, s uh, streams of activities for instance, we build a partnership between business, science, education, because in microelectronics, this partnership, this uh, uh, partnership of stakeholders is critical. We uh, uh, use this partnership to, for instance, one of the examples, to define current and future uh, competences and skills needs in the industry. So we, for instance, we ran, we ran a, a survey for more than 100 European companies asking them what kind of specialist you want to employ now and what you will be employing in 10 years from now. Uh, using this information, using this knowledge, we design and develop uh, innovative VAT uh, curricula, which in, uh, covers uh, technical skills, but plus soft skills as well as an Im important component. We have different activities targeting different social groups, for instance, we work on gender equality for this sector is critical. Uh, we work on integration of migrants because we've been told that we face the, uh, the lack of labor force, but it will not uh, uh, be resolved in the nearest future. We need to deal with the situation when demographic situation will not provide enough learners. So we, immigration would be an important and key element how to integrate these people, how to put them into the system of vocational education, including uh, apprenticeship. This is also what we discuss in the professional community. Yeah, as an example, uh, uh, as an example of uh, uh, such activities where we directly address ap uh, apprenticeship, for instance, we uh, detect European best practice and try to promote it and make um, uptake in, in different parts of Europe. A European, uh, uh, not European, German uh, uh, um, dual uh, IVET, initial vocational education uh, training system, which is built on the concept of apprenticeship, is considered as a European success. It works. It works, it's very well functioning, and it's very well organized. And we try to, uh, and by it's well, well, very, very well uh, described in, in different formal documents like CD4 study recent, so it was uh, presented well. But we try to take another perspective. We try to look at the system through the eyes of learners. We described what we called learner uh, journeys to show different trajectories people can take within the system and how it can support uh, uh, professional development. So, and this information is made uh, available for our partners in from other countries. So we have all in all more than 20 partners in the consortium. We also identify another problem which is suitable for uh, uh, governance reform. And uh, that governance is our main, one of the main uh, priorities. For instance, in Germany, students pursuing their, PhD, uh, their uh, uh, degrees normally work. And they work uh, in the areas very relevant to their future professions, so-called heavies in Germany. And this, uh, I mean, in terms of legal, uh, financial, fiscal aspects, it's all, all very well structured. So people, uh, uh, for instance, they cannot work more than 20 hours a week. There are 
clear wages uh, range for them. There are tax incentives for em employers for, for them to work. But the learning and experience uh, uh, um, gain uh, entailed, entailed uh, in, in, to, uh, here is completely not regulated. There is no system of recognition and no system of certification. Uh, for, for us, for instance, um, students are important labor force and they gain e extremely important practical skills for, through this uh, work and it's not uh, recognized. We also think that even such experiences can be uh, recognized as part of their study and contribute, let's say, in terms of ECTS into their uh, degrees. So, yeah, sorry. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Andre. No, what, what you've been saying is an excellent uh, transition, I think, into... Uh, sorry. In, no, 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 sorry to interrupt you, but I, I think you were making a lot of very good points that I think also um, would transition nicely into... Uh, into what Kai uh, might say, and Kai, for you, I, I wanted to, uh, I think we discussed a little bit again previously now with governance issues and, and the importance of social partner involvement in governance, but a broader multi-stakeholder approach uh, as well to, to governance is key. And I wondered from your perspective how you, or what role you see trade unions contributing in terms of um, having a flexible and an adaptable curriculum when it comes to, to apprenticeship design. Thank yeah, thank you, Robert. Uh, good evening. Uh, good afternoon, not evening. Um, uh, and you got uh, many points um, I can take also from my pers perspective. Uh, first of all, the process uh, for updating apprenticeships in Germany are not even fast. Um, we need run about one to three years if the process goes very fast, because of um, we um, in this process are the representatives of employers, trade unions, um, the trade unions are all um, uh, come together, and uh, this under the head of the Ministry of Education. And um, you know, uh, many of uh, of you know, in Germany we have something uh, a federal structure in the education system. Uh, which also uh, involved and in make the process uh, more um, complex, and um, you s you you uh, bring the point. In Germany, we have a dual system in apprenticeships, which which mean um, the um, apprentices in Germany um, at half of the time at the uh, um, worker's place of his employee and the other half of time in uh, vocational schools and uh, have each uh, run about a half. And the schools are also involved in this process. And if we want, as trade union, uh, bring some new topics in it, for example, taxation or sustainable, uh, <laughs> yeah? You know, okay, thank you. Um, it's uh, kind of difficult to um, go all through these processes with every stakeholder uh, there. And um, for trade units, our workers' councils, you know, are also involved. Um, but one thing is clear, and uh, I'm off. Ah, I'm there. Um, when we need skilled workers, we have to be faster at this process and uh, being better for um, the topics of the time to bring the approaches to, to the actual time. And I would like to, uh, one point uh, I'm phrased in, um, because of the topicality last Friday in Germany, we managed to introduce the training place guarantee in Germany. That was one well, not one, it was a central point for the trade union use at the uh, federal elections in Germany, and we made it. This is a huge success for the young people in Germany who can um, get an apprenticeship after school, had a legal guarantee for this. Thank you very much. Uh, this place, round of applause. <laughs> 
thank you for that. And I, I think uh, I think especially what you were saying about the the need to update the the programs relative to the the new and emerging needs. I think that's also really a shared um, interest there, not only from from the sides of the trade unions and and the the individuals doing the apprenticeship, but of course also for the for the companies themselves. And that's where the the importance of having the social partners in the in the governance structures um, really really comes into play. So thank you for that. So Adam, I'm going to come back uh, to you, uh, if I may, um, and I wondered from your, your perspective what, what role apprenticeships can play in equipping young people with qualifications, but also to support adults when it comes to um, developing skills within the context of the, the digital transition. And we heard or we saw, sorry, from the, the Slido, the importance of not just the, the technical occupation specific skills, but also the the broader sets of, uh, of transversal skills, if you like. What role do you see for your sector? Is it possible within your sector to um, help apprentices achieve both those skill sets in view of their future employability? So the short answer would be yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, I think, in, well, regarding the skills first, um, we think after our program in our association after like two three years uh, they've been uh, like partly working there uh, they actually they their skill set is quite advanced because uh, working with the virtual and augmented reality is quite technically uh, advanced yeah so um, their skill set is quite broad and uh, we intend them to keep them as uh, full-time employees after the, the apprenticeship, after all these programs. But they have so many offers by the bigger companies with like three times bigger wages than we can do. So most of the times they, they just run and they take the best offer they, they get and we, we cannot keep them for a long time. Yeah. So we think that's the like aspect uh, that they have a good set of skills, not even the technical, but even the broad. And the skills are like really useful for their development in the, in the, in the industry or even in, in like different one. Um, regarding the lifelong learning, uh, we are doing a lot of like um, a lot of lectures, courses for companies, for schools, or even for institutions for elderly. And uh, once again, the key aspect for that, for for the education of life lifelong learning, is the motivation. If if even the elderly is motivated, uh, they can perform better than than probably students, you know. So uh, it's it's the motivation for all the age groups. And if I can connect the education and awareness of virtual reality as a great tool for different industries, it's the it's the best way to to give the skill sets for the people they need. And at the end I would like to uh, share with you a message from our president Martin Kotek which cannot make here make it here uh, on the topic of digital transition uh, the digital transition often creates a skills gap where the demand for digital skills outpaces the available talent pool apprenticeships can help bridge this gap by offering targeted training in specific digital skills allowing young people and adults to gain the qualifications and competencies required for the digital roles by aligning apprenticeship programs with the evolving needs of the digital economy, apprentices can stay current and relevant in the face of technological advancements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I, I think very wise words, both from your president and yourself, and, and I think continuing the, the theme we, we discussed there as well about the adaptation, the need to constantly um, reflect how to develop the, the, the content of the apprenticeships in a way that best suits the, um, the interests of the individuals and come back to your point of motivation, but also the interests uh, of, uh, of the employers too. Uh, Frederic, if I can come back to you, um, what's, what's your perspective from, from Nestle on this issue of 
how to develop the wider sets of skills um, beyond the occupation specific? Do you have a particular approach to that in Nestle or is it, is it all sort of one and the same in terms of the curriculum that you have? In fact, in Nestle, uh, we are treating apprentices and trainees like uh, normal employees. It's not that they come to us to learn a, se a specific set of skills. They do it, obviously, but they have access to all the other training that uh, we are providing to our employees. For instance, um, we developed a few years ago uh, the e-business academy to really increase uh, the skill of all our employees on uh, digital skills. But it was quite extensive, so indeed for apprentices coming, they don't spend so much time within the company. So what we did is that we really uh, extracted the, the uh, most important from this academy and we launched, we adapted, we launched the Youth eBusiness Academy that was really meant for apprentices and trainees with a, a much shorter time to have access also to this uh, um, training. So this is the way we try to do, we try to look at uh, uh, how to adapt uh, and then we can, uh, we, we can do it for, for the youth as well. And what we are doing as well is, I believe for me, one of the key uh, success factors for apprentices when they are in our company that, you know, we, we, we didn't talk too much about the role of the tutors or the mentors of the apprentices, but they are extremely important because we know in, our, in Europe that uh, we're going to have to work longer. So we do have many uh, senior people in our company that are really uh, uh, proud to work for us and proud to all the work they, they are doing, so they have also this willingness to uh, transfer their own skills to the apprentices who arrive. So it's a win-win situation because everything that is, uh, is linked to digital, they learn from the young people, but uh, all the rest, which is uh, the experience, you know, problem solving, uh, uh, connecting with the other colleague and all that, they are able to share it with their uh, apprentices. And this is a kind of duo that is working uh, extremely, uh, extremely well. So all this is really done to go uh, beyond, I would say, just the technical skill that you learn via the school, in fact, and that you apply in the companies. And this is uh, inclusivity is really a way of working. And this is something that we value a lot. Thank you very much. And, and thank you also for bringing in that perspective, the, the crucial one of the teachers and trainers in the companies who are the ones actually training the, the apprentices. That's, that's a really uh, crucial aspect to mention. Uh, Andre, then coming back uh, to you, I wonder if you could maybe elaborate a bit more on, on the, the Center of Vocational Excellence and how it brings together the skills required for um, the twin transi transition, the green and digital uh, transition, um, and how, in a way, this can also support gender equality and social inclusion. Thank you. Um, thank you, Robert, for, uh, first of all, for, shorting, uh, for cutting me short before, otherwise our cocktail would be in danger. Uh, and actually, it was a deal with, uh, with Adam. He's uh, short and specific. I'm just speaking. Um, um, First, yeah, I would uh, I would like to cut this question in two parts. First of all, it's about um, uh, transition, uh, dual transition. Of course, uh, without uh, microelectronics, uh, digital transition is just like speaking about dinner without having food. It's um, impossible. Uh, but within, uh, for instance, some of our activities uh, uh, where we develop new innovative curricula for that, we try to be focused on new aspects of microelectronics, so-called green microelectronics, where microelectronic products, uh, first of all, design being green, so less consuming, less polluting for the thermal pollution of environment, but also some modules in our curricula, they devoted to, for instance, recycling of uh, microelectronics, how to make it less uh, dangerous for our lives, for our environment. Uh, we believe that uh, um, in this area, this kind of understanding of mutual dependencies of these two transitions is really important. When it comes to uh, other, uh, the second part of the question about social aspects and uh, uh, gender equality, as I said, soft skill is a part of our innovative curricula. We have special training modules which can be 
uh, easily adapted to different settings, uh, apprenticeship or just school training or university training. Uh, it can be uptaken in different countries of, uh, in Europe. Um, um, an interesting aspect is gender equality. In this area, as you might expect, there is a clear uh, gender disbalance, not balance, but disbalance. We speak about one to five, one to 10 female uh, uh, apprentices or uh, vet students uh, in comparison to male uh, students. We try to uh, address this. Of course, it's a long-term goal, but part of our consortium, member of our consortium is European Center of Women in Technology, uh, and they have the whole program of activities in this respect, and that now this program is integrated into the activities of our college. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Andre. That's that's really interesting, and I, I think it also helps to pick up and reinforce one of the points from the, the new skills agenda about trying to encourage more women to study STEM-related subjects, um, which is indeed is also uh, extremely uh, extremely important. So, Kai, I think you have the honour of uh, the last uh, the last question in in this round. Um, what would you see as the main barriers, but also opportunities offered by apprenticeship contracts? Um, and again, also for you, if you if you want to elaborate on the role that apprenticeships can play in equipping workers for skills for the twin transitions. Yeah, I want to give you an example. In uh, Germany, we are currently off. Ah, I'm there. Ah, uh, okay. So try. In Germany, we have currently a discussion um, about heating systems. Um, may you have noticed um, the government the government wants uh, to all whole households to convert to so-called heat pumps. That's uh, like an electric powered heating, like a, a reverse uh, refrigerator, um, which uh, pumped uh, um, warm air from the outside into your household. And um, however, um, we have not enough specialists to install them uh, right now. So um, voices are quickly raised that we require short trainings um, to can install them um, faster. Um, they want, for example, a short course, run about six months, um, and so the people uh, can install them. But at, the po at this point, when every household have some heating pump, um, they have a shortage um, training, but um, no full apprenticeship, which one is a problem on the um, further job market. And in our perspective, on our position is clear, we stand for complete trainings um, and fully qualified people. Uh, this usually uh, needs around about three years. Um, but of course, to your question, um, there are challenges for us of the twin transitions and in account in this training, we have to adapt this in this training. Um, in the first question, um, I told you it's been a long process, but we had to um, go there and uh, put these topics um, on the line. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think it was a very, very good example that helps to uh, to illustrate the uh, the situation very well. Um, so thank you uh, to our panelists for that. Uh, I think we do also now have some time for any questions that you might like to raise in the room or also online. So is there anybody? Yes, great. I see some hands. Uh, yes, please. Do we have a, I think, a microphone coming? Hi, um, my name is Louise. I'm an oh, yes. apprentice, Sorry. electrical apprentice based in Ireland at the moment. Um, I just wanted to talk about, you mentioned shortages of apprentices and shortages of skilled apprentices. And I'm just wondering, is a common denominator with these, these, these shortages a pay issue? Now, I understand that the EFA can't tell governments what to do, but is there a way for them maybe to recommend set procedures and policies that can be recommended to the individual governments to help with this problem and, and in effect might encourage more apprentices into different fields. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would anybody like to take that question on 
supply, demand, and, and pay. Um, Andre, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, I would try. Um, first of all, I can say that uh, vocational education and training in general is not regulated on a European level. It's uh, national, regional, sometimes local uh, thing. So, and then, uh, um, yeah, European U Union normally uh, operates with recommendations which have a rec recommendative uh, um, recommendation power. It's not imposed. Uh, and uh, speaking about uh, motivation for people or uh, incentives, uh, normally it's done, uh, at least in Germany, I can say, it's on the level of uh, uh, taxation. Uh, as uh, Kai said, uh, it's a dual system. 50% person works in the company, 50% works, uh, not works, studies at school. And for 50%, compensation might, might reach, let's say, 1.2, might 1.3 thousand euro for 50% of position. It's a normal pay, like in, in this industry. So here there is, a, I think, I, I don't see a big problem. The problem starts when um, 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 I, I saw it in other examples, not in Germany, but in other countries where um, there is no pay at all or pay which is unacceptable. And of course, it's demotivating. And the companies also, uh, they are not motivated because there are no uh, fiscal incentives for them. There should be a, a combination of this thing. It's a system which uh, works uh, well when it's regulated with concrete, concrete uh, functions and responsibilities assigned to every stakeholder in the system. Thank you very much. I think we had one question, the lady here and then the gentleman in the shirt and yes, okay, I'm noting. I'll <laughs> Thank you very much. Great for the enthusiasm. So yes, please. Do, do you have the microphone? Yes, great. You have said that uh, apprenticeship is not regulated on the EU level, not even on the national level, um, sometimes not even on the regional level. But maybe a question to Nestle, how you encounter the challenges to offer like a, com a company-wide apprenticeship system? Like, do you try to, um, to have it like company-wide, European-wide, or is it diff different in every single country or region? In fact, uh, the first point I w wanted to say is that we pay all our apprentices and indeed when we launched the program we also started with this understanding that it's not possible to uh, hire them and not pay them. So uh, it, it could have happened in the past but we really ask all our countries uh, in fact to, uh, to pay them. Then the way we do it is very much uh, countrywide, I would say, but also region, uh, re, uh, on a regional basis. We really look at, uh, you know, the way apprenticeship is uh, organized at market level, at country level, that's for sure. And then uh, we obviously follow uh, the national uh, rule for that. And then when we have specific need in some region, we really uh, try to uh, accommodate and go and meet the uh, ministries or the uh, providers locally to to set up something that fits to the need of the region. So that, that really depends. Uh, we are a very decentralized company uh, per se. So for us, each, all our countries are very much used, in fact, to own uh, the way they want to address this. So it really depends on the needs that we have, on the industry needs as well, as I was mentioning, and because in some cases we, have, we, we, don't, we cannot provide enough no or commit to hire enough number of apprentices. Uh, in a class, so that's why we reach out to our colleagues of the same industry and ask if they can also commit to hire at the end uh, five and then uh, we do this uh, uh, by grouping all the others. Also setting up new apprenticeship scheme is quite time consuming for our teams. So obviously by working with other uh, colleagues from uh, other business, uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, easier to make it happen. But we really follow the practices also. I mean, a training, uh, an apprenticeship scheme 
uh, in Switzerland or in Germany has nothing to do, uh, I would say, from a, a school perspective with the Spanish one, but we try to adapt and we follow. We have uh, an internal guidelines uh, on how to set up apprenticeship scheme with some elements that are mandatory, one being indeed uh, the, the pay, the other one being the, the percentage of time that you should uh, uh, spend in the companies or that school. So we follow this guideline and then we adapt. This is the way uh, we, are, we are working. Thank you very much. Uh, I think indeed that point about how much time is in the company, maybe how much is in the school, might also affect the, the issues around pay in, in some circumstances. But so thank you for, for clarifying that. Yes, please. So you are, can we have the microphone in the middle? Yeah, thank you. OK, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm Ignacio Ferrer. Uh, I'm the principal of Chabec Vocational Training Center in Valencia, Spain. And let me to share only a, a thought about uh, augmented reality or digital skills and, and inclusivity, because there are both aspects that you have uh, spoken about during the, for, for all the panelists. Um, augmented reality is used in the industry sector, in mechanical assembly, wiring electricity, and they are replacing traditional skills like understanding drawings or reading instructions and so on. And as a bed provider, sometimes we have a lot of problems to implement uh, that kind of technologies and it's very useful because sometimes we have students who has a lot of problems of learning or uh, intellectual disables or something like that. And, and when they go to do an apprenticeship, it's not a problem. And the company are very happy because they are uh, introducing students who has future employees that have problems. So there are two questions. The first question is, how to implement that kind of technologies in a bed provider school that we have not uh, budget for this? And if somebody of you has experiences, positive experiences in implementing uh, this kind of technologies in, in the companies for apprenticeships or for employees? Thank you. Okay, so interesting ideas, yeah, I have to admit. Um, the answer for the first question, uh, um, um, we, we do have a collaboration with uh, vet providers as well, or, or maybe like the vet schools in Czech Republic, because the apprenticeship situation in Czech Republic is very specific. Um, they didn't have any any like budgets or any any fundings for that as well. So the only way we saw uh, the opportunity to to implement these kind of technologies is to learn the students themselves. You know, show them the the technology, show them the possibility, show them the way how it can how it can be done, and then send them to 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 the vet school or or to the companies and they will show it to to the teachers they will show, show it to the providers they will show it for everyone there and and they will just think yeah that that's cool technology we can use it like they are thinking and their their like thoughts are really good and we can implement that much more easily than when it's coming from the from the national level i would say so we think the it's inspiration and the motivation of the student, once again, it's much more important than some rules or schemes or some like uh, other organization of, of the, uh, of from the, from the national level, yeah. And the second question, or did I ask that as well, uh, answer to that as well? Um, to be honest, not that I am aware. <laughs> I can investigate. Uh, yeah, I can investigate, but uh, so far, uh, I don't know. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, please. Um, I just, 
have uh, um, a little example uh, of uh, ThyssenKrupp, uh, metalworker company in Germany, and um, the uh, uh, apprenticeship for welding. Um, they do some uh, quite uh, pro also nice projects with uh, augmented reality um, for to learn uh, welding uh, because of the um, metal costs are uh, rising, and if you train the welding uh, every piece uh, every piece um, after the pro also after the training. Um, you have to um, throw away, and they do something quite good. Uh, Hi. Um, so, um, in Ireland, they um, managed to increase their um, women apprentices by 40% between twen uh, 2019 and 2022 by introducing programs and initiatives like uh, Try a Trade for a Day um, and um, Ring Fenced Apprenticeships for Women. Um, do you have initiatives like that? Obviously, I know that um, the gentleman from EcoVim um, mentioned that you have really, really good ties um, that to build cooperative projects, but do you have um, other projects or initiatives that you do to help women get into your area, into your industries? Yeah, thank you for the, uh, for the question. Uh, we, um, I, we have identified that in microelectronics, the major demand for labor force is on the higher EQF levels, five, six, seven, eight. So it means that we try to increase the number of uh, girls entering um, uh, let's say high education paths leading into the degrees in microelectronics. Um, it's one of the activities which the European Center for Women in Technology is involved in. So it is done through different promotional events like girls' nights, other activities, days of open doors in our vet providers, targeting girls, uh, schools, school leavers. And this has uh, showed a good result also. So uh, open the, uh, the uh, especially if you can demonstrate in practical terms how the future profession will look like uh, using the facilities of uh, vet providers. It's, it's an example, yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, Andre. We've got time for one last question. Um, so <laughs> I'm sorry, the lady who's got the microphone, <laughs> I guess. We have to thank, thank you. Uh, sorry yeah. to the other one. Hi, so I'm Uliana. I'm with the European Apprentice Network, and I have one and a half question, if that's all right. So, <laughs> uh, first would be specifically for Andre, because uh, you've mentioned that in Germany the compensation for apprentices would be uh, a thousand on average, but uh, the statistics that we have says that it's 657. Uh, the statistics that we've got was uh, from BIBB, so BIB. So, that's very First half of the question, and uh, just if you want to comment on that, maybe you have another statistics that we would like to know about. Uh, and the other question for all panelists would be: Is uh, what would be your proposal solution uh, on gaining broader recognition of apprenticeships as valid form of education? Uh, meaning that not always, obviously, but uh, still way more often than we would like it to be. Uh, skills ga gained by apprenticeship are only recognized within the company that the apprentice was at, um, and. Uh, uh, so, for example, if somebody is, was uh, apprentice in one company, the other company wouldn't accept it. The, sk the skills gained there as valid form of education, or uh, it's not uh, like education enough in eyes of employers uh, compared to, uh, for example, a university degree. Even if the university degree has nothing to do with the field that the position is for. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thanks. Andre. I think the first yeah, yeah. one's to you. I think it was uh, Mark Twain who said that there is a there is a lie, there is awful lie, and there is statistics. Uh, no, I, what I want to say that uh, I, uh, I I give this figure because my daughter is ri right now an apprentice in the but not uh, in the industry, but rather in it's a consulting business, it's insurance business, and she has a um, um, the compensation 1.2 thousand euro for half a position 50 percent time uh, it's brutal of course it's a subject to taxation but uh, I think cash it's about 1,000 so it's uh, uh, how this figure uh, emerged in my in my head speaking about uh, what you said about uh, recognition I, I would say 
certification of uh, exp uh, experiences, skills received through uh, apprenticeship. We're also trying to look into this problem because it's a general problem for any uh, uh, on-the-job training, any. And uh, we are looking with kind of hope to the latest development in, in the field of, let's say, micro-credentials. So there's new things uh, on the EU level, new uh, European Council recommendation on micro-credentials published last year, and probably within the scope of the legal and regulatory developments here, there will be some uh, way to recognize and more or less standardize skills received through apprenticeship. Thank you. Yeah, um, Frederic, indeed, I was going to ask you if you could maybe comment on how you do it in Nestlé. Thank you. I wanted to comment on that uh, and give uh, finally the example of Switzerland. You know, in Switzerland, uh, most, the vast majority of uh, young people, they go through apprenticeship. First, because the quality of uh, the training in apprenticeship is, is really well done and well recognized. So you have the majority, only 30% of uh, young people have the equivalent uh, of the baccalaureate or, uh, you know, the rest is going via apprenticeship. So the quality apprenticeship is very, uh, very much recognized. But I agree with you, we see a little bit of decrease because now, oh, you know, uh, most parents are really willing to send their uh, children so that they get a master's degree. But the thing is that uh, because the selection is made at quite early stage, you still have this 70% who go through apprenticeship. But uh, for me, and this is the beauty of the Swiss system, is that there is always an opportunity to do a kind of uh, a link. You do uh, six months in a school and then you can go back to the I mean, say, uh, the other uh, path. And this is great because you have children who are going through apprenticeship. Some of them, they want to work after it, and it's quite highly recognized, so they can work. Some of them believe that, oh, maybe I can go through a, a bachelor degree or something different or a, a baccalaureate. And it's possible. So this is something that I would really highly encourage the ministries of education and all that to look at how to build this kind of uh, six months where you have the opportunity to try to reach again the path that is not uh, an apprenticeship path. And you see, and then the age is not a, a problem per se. You can have a baccalaureate at the age of 20, 21, nobody uh, cares. But you have the opportunity to do it. So it's really aspirational for young people because you are not kind of, you don't have this image of, uh, I'm not able to go through a normal path, so then I do apprenticeship. No, you do apprenticeship, and then you have the opportunity at many stages of your uh, studies to, to reach out a normal path with six months, one year, but uh, it, it, the system is designed for that. And I think for me, this is amazing to have this opportunity because uh, young people, they have the hope that they can do something else. They have the hope that even if they decide to go through a kind of apprenticeship, there is a way to, uh, uh, to adapt at one point of stage in their studies. And uh, unfortunately, it's quite unusual uh, system, but, um, but I think we should uh, really, uh, uh, first, you need to have quality apprenticeship, that's for sure, to make it uh, recognized and to make it appealing and recognized by everyone that this is a great uh, way to uh, start your, uh, your work. But having this opportunity to reach out another path is something that uh, is also interesting for some young people who really like it. So, and then you, uh, in the upper studies, you, you have children who have gone through apprentices, or not, and nobody cares, because the fact is that they're here all together, and this is what is important. So for me, I, w I would see this uh, opening of possibilities for young people with apprentices as well, uh, to, be, to bring apprenticeship uh, and to have it seen as a valuable uh, career path for everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Frederic. I think that's a very good note to, to end uh, this panel on. So I'd like to thank all the, the speakers. I think they've more than earned their cocktail when it comes. It's not just yet. But uh, if you could please give them all a round of applause. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Robert, for your excellent moderation. Thank you again to all the speakers on the panel. So I invite you to rejoin your, your seats. Um, and indeed, as you have announced, we're uh, reaching the penultimate uh, session of the afternoon. Um, and this is a session dedicated to the AFA champions. Um, so who are the AFA champions, you may ask? Um, so EAFA champions are selected EAFA members who have been highly engaged with the Alliance um, and in their role of ch as champions they will act as advocates uh, for the Alliance by promoting it and sharing the latest updates and news with their different networks. Um, so we'd like to take this opportunity at the end of the afternoon and before the cocktail um, to celebrate um, these, um, these EAFA uh, champions. Um, so I'd like to invite three champions who are here today um, to come up uh, and join me on the stage. Um, so firstly, we have Bart Denny, who is chief teacher, and I hope you will pronounce the name for me uh, when you come on the stage. I think it's Zal Unest. Um, so if, if you'd like to come up on the stage, is Bart uh, in the audience? No, he's online. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, and the name is different. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hotel School de Tundunen, which I'm also pronouncing badly, I think. Um, our second uh, IAFA uh, champion, I'll look over here, Daniela Duella, who is Academy Lead at EMEA Software One, uh, if you'd like to come up and, and join us. And finally, we have Shretan Kokeski, who is director at CDI Macedonia. Thank you. Um, so um, before we go to the cocktail, um, we'd just like to have a couple of words from each of you. Um, so starting with you, Bart, if you'd like to uh, say a few words, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Bart Denis, without two points, so it's Denis. I'm a practical teacher in the hotel school Terduinen, and uh, I give the seventh year world astronomy. Um, I wrote some notes down on my way coming to here. I have been a member for two years already. And for me, when you give a pledge, it keeps you sharp. And when you're sharp, it has a directly benefit for the school or the company. Because you are thinking about what you promised. A promise you have to commit and you have to do your promise. Even that's the thing you learn to your children. Uh, for us, it's very important to have good, very good internships. Like it is important to have good contacts. Before the session started, I already had the opportunity to take two contacts here. Uh, so I'm proud to be here and I'm very uh, thankful for that. Because when you give good internships to the students, they have a direct picture of the reality. Within a week, one of my colleagues is going to Barcelona and Valencia to find new, strong internships for our school. Uh, so if there's anyone in the ballroom here uh, that has connections, please let me know in the reception at the cocktail bar. You never know how it happens. Eh? Thank you in advance. Uh, keeping you sharp. For me, it's like you each year looking at the mirror. Are we still at the level of our pledge that we gave? Like new for us is the Bachelor Culinary Arts. Already with, take a guess, students of how many different countries? 25 different countries. And the third year is starting now in September and we already have 25 different countries for the bachelor degree. Um, another example, at the open doors in our school, I give all the workshops. So I look more than ever focused. Is everyone satisfied? Or they are finding what they are looking for. 
When you are a member, it's like you're getting some more energy that makes you stronger. Also, when you go, when you want to give a message to the alliance, you have direct access. So for us, it's also very important, like it is the year of the skills, to give and stay teaching the basic skills that is so important for the students, for the future. And they have to know the basic skills, not only doing it, but also knowing why they are doing it. And in the right order, so they can be the motivator for the future. Um, so I'm proud to be here. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Bart, for those um, very clear uh, messages about staying sharp. I think it's a good uh, point for all of us. Um, and I'll pass the floor now to Daniela for her messages. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Daniela Döller, um, or pronounced well. <laughs> um, I'm today representing Software One and Software One's Academy. I'm the Academy Lead for EMEA, so I have to correct it a little bit, so I'm not working just for Germany, I'm really working EMEA-wide throughout um, Europe. <coughs> I want to say thank you for inviting me, yeah, and also trusting us uh, being an, an AFR champion. Um, this is really appreciated. The software, software One is a leading global provider for software and cloud solutions. So I'm representing the business side um, today a little bit. Um, and we employ over 9,000 employees across 90 countries. The Software One Academy was founded roughly two years ago with a simple vision. We would like to develop grassroots level technical talent in communities where Software One has a presence. And we want to be also the bridge from education to employment. We offer paid learning and training opportunities. Yes, we also pay our apprenticeships, uh, our apprentices, um, and we give them a technical curriculum, which also includes a business soft and core consulting skills. Coming back to the skills question. Uh, we think that everything is, um, is important. Um, so if somebody only learns the technical skills, it's not enough. They also have to be really strong in social skills, in core consulting skills, and in business skills. So roughly one year ago, we have made a pledge um, that we, across the Software One Academy, want to want to improve the access accessibility to apprenticeships. Uh, we have said that we wanted to provide more than 100 opportunities for apprenticeships and over 200 for graduates and career changers. So it's a little bit less than what Lestle is doing, <laughs> but we are also a little bit smaller. Um, and I do hope that we we can give it a start. I said like 100 apprenticeship opportunities. Um, this we said last year, and I can say we have made it. So we went live in seven countries across Europe um, with an apprenticeship just in three yet. So we offer apprenticeship in Germany, in France, and in Spain. And we are currently investigating Turkey, Italy, UK, and uh, the, um, also some, some other um, countries across Europe. Um, it's very difficult um, because we are not like uh, Nestle, a decentralized company. Uh, we are very much centralized, so I'm really running this apprenticeship initiative from Germany across EMEA. So I'm hoping with a, with a membership of the EFR uh, to also get a little bit of insights and help networking, um, to understand how we can set up apprenticeship across new countries. Um, and we have said that we would like to also act um, as an EFR champion because we would like 
not only to continue our commitment, we also want to do more. We want to act as advocates for the topic apprenticeship. So I would like to engage our apprentices, for example, to share their stories. I would like personally to start um, yeah, sharing reflections and also best practices. I want to investigate in the network, in this great network, what is currently and today here. Yeah, and I'm just really looking forward uh, to this yeah, um, opportunity to act as an EFR champion for this great alliance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniela. Also, congratulations on reaching your, your target. That's fantastic. Uh, and also these really inspiring words about what the, um, you're hoping the network can bring you uh, and can bring all of the, all of the members. Um, so finally, I'd like to give the floor to Shretan, uh, who will give uh, his uh, thoughts and views uh, from Macedonia. Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes motivation and inspiration is uh, really important. Living in, uh, in a small country in the Western Balkans with a little bit different regular, uh, legal framework uh, and uh, different understanding what apprenticeship means comparing to other European countries, uh, we realize that it's important to work in this direction. It's not, and it's not just only past two years we've been uh, members of, of the network, but even before we realized and understood that this is really important um, to, in, to, inv to invest in this direction. Um, um, being member of this network also initiated uh, some other initiatives and, uh, and Erasmus projects to network with our partners. So as a result of, 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 of this, to be more involved, to provide opportunities, especially for younger, younger generation, young people, to be involved at European level and to get knowledge and practical experience and hopefully to return back uh, in, in Macedonia and, and other Western Balkan countries and to apply that knowledge in everyday life, uh, school, education, companies and so on. Um, having in mind limited opportunities comparing to, Euro e, uh, to European member states, I would call for everyone to invest a little bit more. We did a lot, I mean, European Union did a lot uh, past period, but uh, there is much more space also and needs to be done. So I hope to cooperate with all of you and to have much more success. Uh, we made a pledge, we will continue in this direction and me and my colleagues, we really believe in this story that might be successful and will be successful. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shretan, for those inspiring words um, and to all our champions. And I'd also like to send uh, greetings from us uh, to two champions who couldn't be here with us today, but who hopefully are online listening. Um, so it's Mr. Eileen Akcha Oran from ICTERA, who's another AFA champion, and Joe Cahalin from the Education and Training Board in Ireland. So we send them the greetings. <laughs> Thank you. But otherwise, this brings us very nicely to the end of our first day. Um, so I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank all of the speakers um, from this afternoon, all of the moderators, uh, all of you uh, for your uh, active participation in the different uh, panels and with the different questions. Um, so we start again tomorrow. Um, we will start the sessions at 9.30, but there will be coffee available from 9 o'clock. So I really encourage you um, to come from nine o'clock to uh, begin the discussions in an informal way with your colleagues. Um, so uh, please do bring your badges, the badges that you received today, please bring those back uh, tomorrow uh, with you um, and that will help us to, to start on time. Um, and apart from that, as you know, we will now uh, have a cocktail. Uh, so the cocktail will take place. Our um, hosts and hostesses will show you the way, but it's just across in the Netherlands room for a cocktail. Um, I'm told there will be a surprise at the cocktail. Um, so I really encourage all of you uh, to come and join us for that and for some more informal networking. Uh, and otherwise, thank you again to everyone. Uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow and look forward to seeing you now at the cocktail. Thank you. Thank you.